I want to offer a hearty thanks to the funders who were kind enough to underwrite this. Uh, this conference drew out of a couple, uh, grew out of a couple of conversations Jeff and I had hosted over the last couple of years uh, with a number of folks from the worlds of philanthropy and research who were interested in talking about these issues. And two of those were kind enough to step up and fund this research. Uh, that's the W.T. Grant uh, Foundation and the Spencer Foundation. And Jeff and I are deeply appreciative to them because frequently when you talk to funders, they say, well, it's an interesting question, but we don't really feel like paying for navel gazing. And so it can be difficult to actually get the resources to do much of this kind of work. Uh, the hashtag for today's conversation, for those of you who would like to tweet about it, is hashtag new ed Phil. Um, and with that, let me go ahead and introduce our first panel, and we will get started. Um, first up is uh, going to be Jay Green. Jay's paper is titled Buckets into Another Sea. Uh, the reference will be familiar to those of you who followed this in, oh, it stays, hand me the uh, best one, sure. in the book I alluded to a moment before, uh, Best of Intentions, J uh, Jay wrote a enormously influential and quite famous paper called Buckets into the Sea, in which he argued that philanthropy's not really enough money to have a big impact if it's just sprinkled on top of what schools and systems do. Uh, Jay is the uh, department head and 21st century chair in education reform at the University of Arkansas. His books include Education Myths, What Special Interest Groups Want You to Believe About Our Schools and Why It Isn't So. Second up is Sarah Reckow. Sarah's paper title is Singing from the Same Hymn Book, Education Policy Advocacy at Gates and Broad. She co-authored the paper with Megan Tompkins Stange, a lecturer in public policy at uh, the Ford School at the University of Michigan. Megan is also with us today. Uh, Sarah is an assistant professor of political science at Michigan State. Uh, her uh, first book is Follow the Money, How Foundation Dollars Change Public School Politics. Uh, her work has also appeared in uh, scholarly journals such as Education, Researchers, Education Researcher, Urban Affairs Review, and Policy Studies Journal. Up third will be Jeff Snyder. His paper is How Old a New Foundation Giving Defer. Jeff's a doctoral candidate and dean scholar in education policy at Michigan State. Uh, his research focuses on questions of education politics, policy, and governance. And his work has appeared in journals including Education Researcher, Education Policy, and the American Journal of Education. Our discussant on the first panel uh, is, my, uh, is, is an old and dear friend, Stacy Childress, CEO at the New Schools Venture Fund. Uh, Stacy previously led uh, K-12 Next Generation Learning Team at the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, I first got to know Stacy back when she was a professor at the Harvard Business School, looking at these questions of educational innovation and reform. Uh, and a uh, fun fact, Stacy was named one of Forbes Impact's 15 Innovators in Education just a couple of years ago. Jay, if you'd be kind enough to get us started. Sure, thanks. Um, so uh, it's a little hard for me to see this, but I can, I can see this. So I, I hope that, uh, that I'm, I'm talking from the same thing that's being shown on the screen here. Um, so yes, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it is actually remarkably hard to have a constructive, uh, data-driven discussion of education philanthropy. Um, which is perhaps why uh, these discussions only occur once a decade. Um, and, uh, but I think they're incredibly useful discussions uh, because I think it's remarkably hard to do uh, education philanthropy well, and I think uh, that that uh, effort would be improved if it were uh, subject to um, thoughtful and, and empirical analysis and criticism um, and if it were possible for us to actually have these kinds of ca candid conversations. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, as Rick men mentioned, uh, a decade ago I wrote a chapter called Buckets into, a sea, in, in, into the Sea, where I argued that the scale of education philanthropy was simply too small to have an effect on education policy through the sheer force of its dollars. While millions or even billions of dollars feels like a lot of money to you and me, um, to the education uh, industry, it's actually small change. Um, so uh, keep in mind that uh, every year the public school system spends over $600 billion a year. Um, and total education philanthropy is much smaller than that, uh, uh, between one and two billion. So uh, the new 
the new C, um, yeah, I, I think that, that around the same time that, that I wrote that chapter, uh, foundations were making a shift. Um, my recommendation a decade ago was... Oh, time cards. I'm sorry? Oh, okay, I thought... Um, a, around a decade ago, uh, the, the um, foundations were shifting towards uh, what I was recommending, uh, which was that they not just try to buy change, but try to, to change policy, um, uh, because then they could leverage their smaller dollars with public dollars and produce larger scale policy change. Um, and I think they've been moving significantly in that direction. Um, but they found a new C, I'm afraid, uh, into which to pour their money. Um, and, and the new C, unfortunately, is that policy change actually requires constituents. And, uh, and I don't think foundations have thought well enough about how to cultivate constituents for the policy change they're attempting to achieve. Okay, so I begin my analysis essentially with five uh, um, assumptions. Uh, if you don't accept these things, forget everything else that I'm going to tell you. Um, I have reasons. I, I, I can try to defend these five claims, but, um, uh, but I can't defend them empirically. They're just f five uh, insights about uh, the, the politics of, of our K-12 education system. So the first is the foundation dollars are too few to, to buy change directly. Um, and this was essentially the analysis I did a decade ago. So again, total giving is between one and two billion dollars from, from all foundations. The top 15 foundations uh, that I analyzed gave under 900 million dollars to education. Uh, and the amount falls off dramatically as you get down to number 15. So if you just kind of extrapolate where it must be, it has to be below $2 billion. A decade ago, I estimated the total amount of private giving to schools from everything from the bake sale to the Gates Foundation at $1.3 billion. Um, and the bake sale is not trying to produce, um, you know, policy change. So, um, uh, so... I, I think it's safe to say that it's under $2 billion in total philanthropic giving. Uh, as of 2011, uh, K-12 public spending was about $620 billion. The increase every year in public spending has averaged $10 billion over the last decade. So every year, I mean, it's gone down a little bit with the, with the Great Recession, but um, still, even with that decline, we're talking about over $10 billion a year in annual increase in public spending. So th the total amount the foundations have to give is a fraction of the, t of the annual increase that public schools can expect. So there is nothing that foundations can buy that public schools can't buy on their own if they want it. Okay? Nothing. So, that, so it's important to keep that in mind. Second uh, assumption of the system is that um, the K-12 system is a wash in ideas. The K-12 system no more needs foundation ideas than they need their money. Now, it's true that schools will say, we want your money, we need your money, yes, we value your ideas, but they don't need them. They really don't. They have plenty of ideas, they have lots of their own ideas about what works, what's good, and, they're not, and any theory of change that's based on the idea that the K-12 system is out there sitting waiting for you know, foundations to tell them what works and are eager to do it once they're told is a naive theory. Third, K-12 education is dominated by an organized set of interests. Um, and these organized interests have constituents, millions of them, who, are, who have beliefs and interests and they're pursuing them in an organized way. Fourth, the K-12 system is incredibly decentralized, despite efforts to centralize it over the last decade, uh, actually over the last several decades. Uh, it remains almost 90% locally and state funded. Uh, and also um, uh, uh, virtually all decisions, especially operationally, are occurring locally uh, in states and school districts. And so it's very hard um, to access the, the entire system of education from one central point, either, either with ESEA uh, reauthorization, which is consuming DC's energies. It matters, but it doesn't matter that much because there's a big country out there and almost all the decisions that occur will occur out there and not here. Um, fifth, 
monitoring and enforcement costs are extremely high in education. So teachers close their door and they do whatever they want uh, behind that closed door. So you can issue policies, you can make statements, you can have standards, you can do whatever you want. And in the end, there's a teacher in a classroom and that teacher will do what the teacher wants. And it's very hard to get the teacher to change what the teacher does. Okay, so if all those things are true, the two basic implications are the foundations don't have enough money and they don't have enough political clout to achieve their goals on their own. Um, so if, if the 2005 chapter was they don't have enough money, the new C is they don't have, have constituents, they don't have the political power. Foundations don't fully realize this, and they don't fully realize this because they believe that they're rich and powerful. And everyone here believes they're rich and powerful and tells them so, reinforces this on a regular basis. But, you know, the truth is they're just not that rich, they're not that powerful, they're not that good looking, and they don't smell that nice, <laughs> you know. Um, and so it's relatively easy for foundations to purchase the conversation, especially a DC conversation, because it's a relatively small world of people who are extremely hungry for foundation dollars, and they'll talk about whatever it is the foundations want them to talk about. I'm not saying that they, people can, be, that their principles and their ideas are, are bought, but their, their, their conversation is bought, what they're, what they're gonna talk about. But that doesn't change what's happening out there in schools and classrooms, right? That you can, you can even change the conversation in state legislatures. That takes a lot more money and a lot more power. And you can even change that, but it, still you haven't changed what actually happens in schools and classrooms. So if you're going to have an effect as a foundation, you have to leverage your limited dollars by redirecting public dollars, and you have to recognize the lack of political constituents that foundations have, and you have to support policies that generate them. So, uh, some examples. So, let's just talk about Uber. How has Uber tried to change transportation policy? It's a little bit similar to how foundations are trying to change education policy. We're talking about an incredibly decentralized system with very well organized political interests controlling the local transportation industry. So how does Uber change it? Uber hasn't done any of the things the foundations are trying to do. They haven't go gone out and bought medallions in every city. They haven't, um, um, uh, uh, you know, att attempted to buy ads in the newspaper saying let's change the policy. Instead what they've done is they've created uh, um, local operating companies that create constituents, the drivers and people using it, even in places where it's not fully legal. And then those people fight on behalf of Uber. They create those constituents to fight for them so they can change transportation policy. Um, Similarly, we can see this story with charters and de Blasio. I don't really have time. Um, uh, in addition to creating policies that, that have constituents, you can also talk about institutions that create, institution, uh, create constituents. So if you look at a lot of the Gilded Age philanthropists, uh, what they did is they built institutions. And what, by building institutions, they, they created constituents who then advocated for the things that they wanted. So Julius Rosenwald built 5,000 schools across the South. Um, now he leveraged public dollars uh, because he worked with school districts. Larry Cuban's right that there was a price to this. They were segregated schools and they had all the Jim Crow uh, restrictions placed on them. But what they did is they created a constituency of, um, of a black middle class that then was at the forefront of the civil rights movement decades later. That's how you create change, is by building institutions or creating policies that then create constituents who then go fight for the change on their own and, and not just the mercenaries that foundations can buy. I mean, asking the poli what political influence have found has foundations is like asking how many troops has the pope, um, which is to say none. Um, they could only have mercenaries they can buy, and that's not enough to win against an organized set of interests. Um, so there's a political, uh, there's a descriptive analysis that if you look at what foundations are actually giving, they're giving overwhelmingly to things that don't create constituents. Um, they are either giving to programs that don't create constituents, or they're giving to um, to advocacy without creating constituents. 
Um, and they give almost virtually nothing to research, which is also fascinating. Um, uh, so they you know, have firm convictions about you know, what to do. They don't need to know. Um, uh, but they're not creating constituents very effectively with this work. So, uh, and then if you're interested in talking later, we can see the foundation by foundation breakdown um, as well. Uh, and some of them are, are, I think, are creating self-sustaining, creating constituents more effectively than others. So sorry I've used up more, more than my No, time. no, no, Jay, thank, that, that's fine. And in fact, um, it's on me, what I, what I should have said is we explicitly told these guys, uh, this is the Super Bowl ad presentation of these papers. Uh, there's a lot in these papers. Uh, they're meaty, they're substantive. Uh, in order to make sure that this thing uh, is moving, both a moving and kind of um, feedback-driven conversation, we've asked folks to just keep their presentations to 10 minutes. So. There's a lot more in the papers than any of these guys uh, are going to get a chance to talk about. It's absolutely, the papers are available. It's worth perusing them um, and making sure uh, you get the full benefit of what they've got to say. Um, Jay, thanks. And we'll have, as part of each panel, we're going to have about 40 minutes, 45 minutes of conversation. So there will be a lot of opportunity for folks to uh, ask questions and clarify. Uh, Sarah. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm Sarah Reckow from Michigan State, and my co-author is Megan Tompkins-Stange from the University of Michigan. Um, and forgive me, I'm going to be leaning here. I have some animation, so like Jay, I want to <laughs> keep on track. I was trying to make sure I could do that. Uh, so our paper is uh, kind of motivated by this issue of uh, a lot of talk that Gates and Broad, in particular, have been very influential in federal education policy under the Obama administration, whether it's in the media, with coverage of the Common Core, sort of anecdotally discussed. And we were interested in looking at that systematically and trying to understand sort of the extent of, of that influence, the strategy, and how it really came about. And we use three pieces of evidence to do that. Um, we draw from interviews with Gates and Broad Foundation officials. Uh, we draw from grant dollars distributed by both foundations. Um, and then we draw from uh, the participation of grantees in one particular issue area, the issue of teacher quality, and their involvement in federal policy debates around that issue. And one thing that emerged across all three pieces of evidence that we were using that this quote um, helps to typify is um, an, an alignment of agendas, linking actors from the foundations to the federal Department of Education, um, and then across the grantees that were being supported and were involved in federal policy. This quote comes from a Gates Foundation official um, discussing how all these organizations are suddenly singing from the same hymn book and getting money from the same organization, that organization they are speaking about themselves, the Gates Foundation. Um, and what we wanted to understand is how did this alignment come about? What, what were the foundations doing exactly? And then maybe taking a step back in a more critical way to think about um, what is the long-term impact of this on policy? What really happens when you start talking about implementation? And um, how does it impact the policy debate? Um, and speaking to the issue of both alignment between the foundations and, um, and then with the, the Department of Education, if you look at the trajectory of Gates and Broad, um, both starting around 2000, both of these foundations were, were more focused on the district level in their early grant making. And over time, um, starting around 2005, as, as Jay started to speak about, and then building through 2008, you, you do see a market shift toward the federal level. And the Ed and 08 campaign is, is certainly one example of this, where they uh, explicitly partnered together. Uh, but also, this emerged in quotes uh, from the officials at both foundations, for instance, someone at Broad speaking about how we have in this administration a Secretary of Education pushing for the ideas that, that um, Eli Broad had been pushing for over a decade. Um, and then similarly, someone from the Gates Foundation um, discussing how um, when the dynamics are right, which would have been 2008, we get an education secretary, more importantly, an education secretary from a district that was our grantee. Um, and then you've got the ability to drive forward and push it off balance at the federal level. So seeing this window of opportunity um, with the Obama administration, I think there's also a, a, a bit of a partisan story here that these foundations had uh, kind of a little bit more alignment with the Democratic Party and 
Gates particularly, some people spoke of not being quite as enthusiastic about aligning with the Bush administration as they were under Obama. And this uh, story is also supported by the grant data. So this is data collected from um, all the grants distributed by um, Gates and Broad in 2005 with the gray bars and 2010 in the black bar. Um, this, uh, these dollars are indexed for inflation and you've got millions of dollars there on the axis. And across four categories you can see I use public and charter schools here simply um, as a comparison point to show not a great deal of change in those categories. But if you look at the balance of funding going to locally Sarah, based- Sarah, just, so you mean district schools and charter schools, right? Um, oh, yes, traditional- District schools. Traditional district schools and then uh, charter schools, yeah. Okay. Um, and so a decline in funding that's going to more locally based organizations that work within school districts and a really uh, noticeable growth in organizations, uh, grants dealing with national advocacy more than double the funding during that time period. And what we also look at is, okay, so how involved are these organizations? Um, you know, they can be giving money to national advocacy and then people just talk to each other and are they really communicating with federal policymakers? And here we turn specifically to the issue of teacher quality. Um, there are other issues, of course, we could have focused on, but this is certainly one where Gates and Broad um, had similar priorities around teacher quality related to reforming teacher evaluation systems, um, incorporating student test scores into those evaluations, some instances of um, uh, pay for performance. And this shows, um, this is from 96 congressional hearings on teacher quality from 2000 to 2012, over 400 witnesses in the data. These are the most frequent appearances, most frequent witnesses, um, the organizations. Um, and I should add, appearing this many times is rare. The vast majority of organizations only get one opportunity to testify across those 12 years. Um, and these are all the ones that appeared three or more times want to highlight that the Gates Foundation does appear in this list with three, um, three times to testify. Additionally, you see the NEA and the AFT, the two main teachers unions represented, but you also see a newer organization like the New Teacher Project down there at the bottom. Lastly, there's a really noticeable growth in funding going to these very highly involved organizations, a tenfold increase um, across this group. And I think that's noteworthy that there, there's sort of a direction of funding to the, to the most involved um, actors at the federal level. And we also looked at this as a proportion of all the witnesses testifying on teacher quality in each year. Um, and this is uh, based on whether uh, the organization testifying received a grant from Gates or Broad within two years prior to giving their testimony. Um, and you can particularly notice with Gates, the black bar, um, quite a substantial increase by the time you get to 2011, 2012. So you'll see um, a panel of witnesses with three out of four witnesses uh, being recipients of Gates Foundation grants um, in, a, in a hearing by that point. But I think really important to emphasize, if we're talking about singing from the same hymn book, what are these folks talking about when they have the opportunity to commute with, communicate with federal policymakers. And um, two stories I, I'll just highlight from this. One, you can look at an organization like the New Teacher Project, released a very important report, The Widget Effect, in 2009, and had sort of a well-known position on this issue, a lot of recommendations about reforming teacher evaluation systems. Um, they were getting a lot of money from Gates and Broad by 2010, as well as other foundations. And you see sort of their continuing involvement in federal policy making, additional invitations to testify. And I think here it's a story of building the capacity of a new voice to be very active um, in a number of different ways, of course, but one way is through advocacy. Um, on the other hand, um, if you look at something like the AFT, AFT, a teacher's union, more complicated story for sure on their positioning on this issue. Um, they were a Gates grantee in 2010, um, and you do see Randy Weingarten at that time testifying about um, a natural outgrowth of teacher evaluation being differentiated compensation systems. Interestingly, the other panelists on that particular hearing include someone from New Schools Venture Fund and um, Professor Tom Kane from Harvard, both uh, specifically uh, noting their alignment with Randy Weingarten in, in their own testimony as well. Um, and 
in addition to the on this issue of singing from the same hymn book, we're interested in the role of research because there is this research funding. It's not always necessarily thought of as advocacy funding, but what we find is that sometimes the uh, research funding is, is specifically aligned with the advocacy agenda and that the officials at the foundation spoke about this. So, so for instance, someone from Bro talking about how um, there's all these, you know, it's not just doing good research, um, it's doing work that's going to have an impact. And a really interesting quote from a Gates Foundation official about value-added research um, and the, the level of uncertainty that might emerge in that work but the degree to which uh, you may not bring that uncertainty out in more of an, uh, you know, a paper where you're trying to influence policy. So the way we look at this more systematically is to see the degree to which witnesses testifying on teacher quality are citing the same reports. So this is a network of, of our um, witnesses from those 12 years of teacher quality hearings. And, uh, a link between each circle represents an organization with a witness that testified. A line between any two circles indicates that they cited the same report. Green circles are the recent are people who got recent foundation grants at the time they testified. Um, so there, that circle uh, with teacher performance evaluation um, includes Harvard, TNTP, New Teacher Project. Uh, they are citing a common set of reports related to value-added models, pay-for-performance systems, and it is most notably the, the, the tightest, most coordinated cluster in our network. So in terms of implications, uh, we want to emphasize that uh, there's a lot going on here that's political, some of which is actually sort of labeled as research but aligned with an advocacy agenda. But interestingly, um, you know, there's, there, there is some questioning and questioning coming from the foundations about what impact this has on the debate. And this quote comes from a Gates Foundation official who said, we have this enormous power to sway the public debate public conversations about things like effective teaching or standards and mobilizing lots of resources in their favor without real robust debate. I mean, it's striking to me, really. And I think that really emphasizes our final implication, which is what happens if, uh, Jay kind of spoke to this, that you have a conversation, you have this apparent consensus among federal uh, interest groups, but what happens when you're talking about state and local officials and the actual implementation? Thanks. Ter terrific. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and we'll actually delve a lot into that, obviously, in panel two uh, on some of these challenges uh, that are in criticisms, and then in panel three when we talk about what this all means. Um, Jeff uh, looked into this question. We talk a lot about some of these, um, you know, new philanthropies, but there's also this question of the, a large, established, pre-existing philanthropies and how they have played in the last decade and how they have or have not chosen to change. Jeff. Yes, so thank you for the lead in. Um, good morning, everyone. And so I became keenly aware of this as Sarah and I were doing some work uh, on the largest foundations and how dominant the conversation has been around these new foundations. And so when I talk about old foundations, I talk about, uh, I don't mean that disparagingly, um, but more that they've long been active in K-12 uh, philanthropy and one of the big indicators and, and um, one of the grant programs that typifies this is the Annenberg Challenge that worked with traditional districts, um, whereas the new foundations have really exemplified this venture philanthropy role, trying to maximize their social impact and oftentimes working with those outside traditional uh, education organizations. And so given those narratives, I had the question of, well, are they funding different priorities. Do they, do they do that? And then Sarah and I had also looked at how they fund. Um, and so this idea of convergent grant making, targeting the, those dollars into the same types of organizations. So these two questions came up. Do they fund uh, distinct priorities and do they fund them differently in this convergent grant making? And so I used, uh, like Sarah and Jay, uh, the tax return documents from 2000, 2005, and 2010. Uh, 2012 is the most recent year available. And so this shouldn't be looked at as something of what's going on today, but moreover, what happened in the first decade of the 21st century. Um, as you'll see on the next slide, I used two, uh, or, I'm sorry, five old foundations and five new foundations. Um, and all these grants were coded by, some were by Sarah and I, um, and also there's some new data in this, to see where are they giving, a charter schools, national research, and there's all sorts of different things that have been collapsed for analytic purposes. 
And so this is their funding in 2000, 2005, and 2010. You can see the organizations I chose on the right-hand side um, legend. And so I mainly include this for a takeaway. It, one, it provides us a striking reminder of the new foundations really are directing a, a lot more resources than the old foundations, but that's a relatively new phenomenon. In 2000, the old foundations were still granting more. Um, so I just want to really hammer that home that this is a new, uh, new phenomenon, relatively speaking. And then these are some areas, I don't know how readable this will be uh, in the back, but where their priorities are most different. Um, so the first two groups uh, are areas where old foundations are giving a, a higher percentage of their dollars than new foundations, one of them being university-based research and university-based uh, teacher and leadership development programs. The second cluster of bars would be national and state level policy research and advocacy, and this would also include associations of elected officials like the NGA and also the Council of Chief State School Officers. Um, so old foundations are giving more to, to the, these points as a percentage. So remember, dollars are, are, are drastically different. But there's a, a qualitative difference here as well. Um, old foundations are primarily giving around the goals of early childhood education, improving university-based staff development, rural education, and those types of issues. Whereas the new foundations are targeting charter schools um, and building data systems. And a lot went to Gates' small school development programs that uh, have now largely ceased. The next three groups are those areas where new foundations are, are giving substantially more uh, attention than old foundations. And so private and charter schools are, I mean, everyone knows those. They're challenging the traditional public school system in providing it, in giving new providers. Um, one thing that's striking to me is the de-emphasis of the private schools as the decade wore on and almost a, 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 a mirror shift to focusing on charter schools. And then also within the charter schools, um, funding, in 2000, 71% went to individual schools from the new foundations. By 2010, that relationship almost flipped on its head, and 81% went to charter management organizations. And so there's been a, a, a marked shift to fund those groups that are expanding the sector. And then the, the second to last group would be venture philanthropy, um, groups like New Schools Venture Fund, Charter School Growth Fund, and only one of the groups of note actually existed before 2000, New Schools Venture Fund. Um, for one year. For one year. <laughs> so it's not surprising they're not in the 2000 data. Um, but, but by uh, 2005, new foundations, it became one of their biggest growth areas. And almost all the money, I think it was, uh, I don't know if I have the exact figure, it was like 81% um, went to New Schools Venture Fund or the Charter School Growth Fund. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an area of big, sh uh, big growth for the new foundations, and it's primarily going to those two groups. And then I, I include this little add on the last, the last group of bars to show it's, it's not always different, even though that is the main takeaway. Um, these alternative teacher and leader development organizations, so your TFAs, your new leaders for new schools, those types of organizations often are framed as a new foundation. Uh, uh, they, they direct the money there. But it's also old foundations, in terms of a percent of their dollars, are also giving to these organizations. And not only giving roughly similar percentages, but giving in the almost identical trend. And so I just want to add that in there. Even though the story is largely one where old foundations are funding traditional systems and new foundations are funding kind of these new uh, non-traditional organizations, there are some very few areas where they align relatively closely. So then I looked at this idea of convergent grant making. Um, and so the, the top table just shows the percentage of old and new foundation grantees who received funds from more than one old or new foundation. And then the, the well, the table got cut off. Um, and then the, the bottom row was showing what percent of older new foundation funds actually went to those groups. And so the trend you would see, and you'll see in the paper, is that old foundations had a relatively stable percentage in both. The percent receiving funds from multiple old foundation funders, and also the percentage of old foundation funds that they uh, received. New foundations, on the other hand, consistently grew at each of my cut points, um, suggesting that there might be more uh, emphasis on a shared set of priorities by funding into the same organizations. And so another way to look at this is via social network analysis, <clears throat> similar to what Sarah did with uh, her stuff. This looks at a, a more specific subset of those organizations receiving funds from multiple funders. Um, specifically, they had to get a million dollars, and they had to share 
two funders with another grantee. So the nodes would be a grantee organization, and the lines would signify that they shared at least two funders, and a bolder line would be more funders, and a larger node would mean they got more money. Uh, and so this is the 2000 old foundation network. It's somewhat sparse. And on the right-hand side, there's Annenberg Challenge organizations. And on the left-hand side, there are groups uh, primarily focused on, uh, or the, at least their grants were focused on, developing university-based teacher and leadership prep. Um, I tried to do this in 2000 for new foundations, and you can't. Only one organization met my criteria. In 2005, the upper right is the old foundation network. Similar issues, similarly sparse. But by 25, uh, 2005, um, the new foundation network is already very dense, and some of the expected players are, are key in this network. So the right-hand side and the, the bottom and a little bit on the left-hand side would be charter schools, um, Teach for America, and new leaders make an appearance in kind of the middle right. I'm sure that's not readable, um, but it's in the paper, I swear. And then the, there are some advocacy organizations, uh, or I should say policy organizations, like Council for uh, Chief State School Officers, um, and the NGA on the left-hand side, who were working on developing data systems. Uh, so the expected thing, based on what we saw about the priorities, the expected players are in here, but it's a dense network. The, the new foundations are very much targeting these preferred organizations. By 2010, the old foundation network has gained some density, but it's still kind of the same issues around tr reforming traditional systems and working with traditional uh, actors. The 2010 network for new foundations, though, has exploded in density, and the people, the, the organizations that were in the 2005 network have moved to the center. So Teach for America, uh, New Schools Venture Fund, uh, those actually got funds from all five of my new foundations, and so they become very central to this uh, story. And all these new entrants, for the most part, work around the same issues, helping organizations that challenge kind of the traditional system. So what are the big takeaways? One, that their priorities are fairly distinct. Um, traditional systems for new school, or old foundations, I'm sorry, and non-traditional organizations for new foundations. Uh, but there's, there's one caveat that the 2010 network kind of like keeps nagging at me, and it's, it's getting more dense. And you can't make a hard... Uh, distinction based on just that one year. So in the future, it'll be interesting to see if they increase their network density just as new foundations did. Um, so that's something to monitor. But I, got, I guess the overall question is, does it matter? Um, and I think a critic of the Annenberg Challenge who would have said that the program failed because it didn't challenge the status quo or um, spread its resources too thinly would have the same critiques against modern the modern versions of the old philanthropies who um, continue to fund primarily the traditional organizations and also continue to, rather than target their funds, engage in a very um, variant network of, of grantees. Thank you, Jeff. Stacy, you've been involved and seen this stuff from a number of vantage points uh, in recent years. Curious to hear what you, your thoughts and what you make of these papers. Yeah, this is really fun for me being, um, by the way, I should start by saying I, I did spend four years at the Gates Foundation. I joined in the summer of 2010, and so I was kind of after uh, the period of time in which the data is collected here. However, I want to make clear I am not uh, anyone's confidential informant uh, in many of these papers. <laughs> In fact, I am on the record in Alexander's paper uh, later today. Um, so uh, and I want to come back to that issue. Um, the other thing, I was, it's the first time I've ever been a respondent. I'm usually uh, one of your paper writers, Rick, and the, it, I'm, I'm, it made me think this morning about this time uh, I was doing a paper in Lily Eskelin, who's now the elected president of the NEA, was a respondent. And, my BlackBerry was on the table. As I started presenting my paper, it was on C-SPAN, I got a note from my mom, you know, you're doing great. <laughs> and, then, and then when Lily, you know, 20 minutes later began in her lovely, gracious, and highly, highly intelligent way, began to eviscerate the two weakest points in my paper, I got a buzz, your daddy and I love Lily, you know, <laughs> exclamation point, exclamation. So let's see if, if uh, I can pull off um, that kind of analysis um, here. I'm actually going to start with if Jeff's paper and move, um, move to the right here, my right. Um, I have an alternative title for Jeff's paper, which is uh, Jeffrey's paper, which is Dead or Alive, mm -hmm. Does It Matter? <laughs> um, <laughs> 
because I thought a lot about this uh, when I worked at the Gates Foundation. So it was interesting to actually think of all three of these papers and, and the points that they make in the context of old philanthropy versus new philanthropy. Um, and I think in general, one of, one of the things I want to weave through here is perhaps at times an alternative explanation for some of what was going on, which is just rooted in human behavior. Um, both the living donors that have these foundations and their program teams are real human beings uh, who have real experiences both separately from each other and oftentimes in other contexts with each other before they're in the current jobs they're in now. And I think that is actually a, a real dynamic uh, in many of, in many of um, the points in the, in the papers. Um, one thing that struck me about Jeff, Jeffrey's paper is, you know, at one time, the old philanthropy in his uh, uh, data set actually had living donors. So while now they are long dead and revered uh, figures uh, in, our, in our history, um, there was a time in which, and, and Jay points this out, they were alive and well and much more involved in the decision making, of course they were alive, they were uh, much more um, obviously being directive about the um, uh, grants that were being made. And I would um, submit, I think it's worth considering that the ways in which those foundations that are now considered old and focused on existing institutions actually behaved somewhat similar uh, in many ways to the new philanthropy that, that Jeffrey points out. And so, you know, Jay had some examples of those very foundations creating new institutions, not investing directly in uh, the existing status quo institutions, but creating new alternative institutions to address specific problems that they felt the existing institutions either were uninterested or incapable uh, of addressing. And so I think it's just worth considering if whether or not there's some kind of life cycle um, dynamic going on with these large foundations with named donors living or dead that is rooted in human behavior and connected to perhaps the experience that those um, principles uh, had as largely business people when they were building their own great wealth that now allows them to be uh, philanthropists. Um, uh, the uh, um, other thing I think about uh, Jeffrey's paper which is interesting um, is, uh, I think it's implicit in some of what you write, or maybe you weren't thinking this, and I was just over um, uh, interpreting. I, I do think uh, something to consider and, and make a little more explicit is with the new philanthropists, it is true that the uh, organizations they largely have funded in the, in the period of time you studied were, um, many of them were new, um, and um, that funding base got more dense over time in terms of where the money was going and the subset of organizations. But I think if you step back and, and think about the context of 99, 2000, um, it really does kind of mark the beginning of this phenomenon of education entrepreneurship. So prior to that, um, you know, there were a lot of long-standing youth-serving organizations and organizations serving uh, school districts and, and uh, children directly. But, you know, around 98 to 2000, 1998 to 2000, there became much more of a, uh, at least a focal point of this term, an education entrepreneur. Um, and yes, the organization I lead now, New Schools Venture Fund, was uh, beginning around that time. Um, and it's around the time these new philanthropies were beginning to really ramp up their grant making. Uh, and so if you kind of juxtapose that um, insight that perhaps the new philanthropy is acting an awful lot like the old philanthropy used to when the billionaires were alive, it's not so surprising really that with a rise in a new set of organizations that were entrepreneurial and somewhat spiritually or philosophically familiar um, to uh, these new donors, that a capital market, a, a segment of the philanthropic capital market would kind of rise up and organize itself around these new entities. So I think that's something just worth, uh, worth considering. Um, in, in Sarah's uh, paper, I think her most important quote, this is one woman's opinion, um, is actually at the very end on page 28. We're kind of paraphrasing here. She said, it's likely the foundation saw out organizations already aligned with their priorities or their objectives, rather than the informant uh, Gates quote, who said, "You know, suddenly everybody's singing from the same um, from the same uh, page." I think it can look like that in retrospect that perhaps all this money flowing into organizations caused them to think and behave differently. I think there's an alternative explanation, which is there 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 was kind of an emerging consensus around the time on this teacher uh, effectiveness stuff, whether you agree with it then or in retrospect, there was kind of an interesting bipartisan 
cross-sector consensus about some of the key principles there. There were some very in influential thinkers about that in terms of Hanyashek and Rivkin and Tom Kane, certainly, but you know, the notion that suddenly foundation dollars flowing to organizations caused them to change what they thought, believed, and would say, I would just challenge you to think about that a little bit from your own perspective as an individual. Um, and you know, would you behave that way um, if you were either leading or uh, on the staff of any number of these many, many organizations. Um, and if you wouldn't, examine why you imagine the people in those organizations kind of in mass would. If you wouldn't, why would they? Um, and if you would behave that way, maybe think a little bit about the deeper issues and, and challenges that are inherent in that if, if most of us would change our beliefs and behaviors uh, for, for a few hundred thousand dollars, I think we've got kind of a deeper problem than um, a handful of new philanthropists trying to influence policy. I also, I was thinking about Jay's paper and Sarah's together. There's almost a little bit of inherent, I think, conflict. Jay says they're not nearly as rich and powerful mm -hmm as they think they are, as we think they are, and then and, and I think some of what comes out of Sarah's work, at least in her quotes from other people, is we're so super powerful that we don't know our own strength and we're causing these things to happen without good public debate and, uh, and uh, um, we should be more uh, judicious or, or responsible about that. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing to tease out a little bit. Are they super powerful and can with a wave of a few hundred thousand or a few hundred million dollars change what people think and say, or are they not really all that powerful at all and just think they are? I think, I think that's a nice tension, fun tension as a former professor um, between these two papers. The other thing I want to point out about that I found in Sarah's paper interesting, and I will confess this, this is t totally rooted in my internal experience at the Gates Foundation. I think the, the notion that, uh, and I know this came from a confidential informant, I um, kept thinking about the wire, I was reading Sarah's thing, like envisioning bubbles as you know the uh, someone's confidential informant about the goings on at the Gates Foundation for his twenty dollar um, you know meal and cab fare home. Um, the uh, the political uh, leaning of the foundation. So so you've got a quote about the progressives. Um, in, uh, I think they called themselves liberals back then, but now they would call themselves progressives, um, being um, predisposed to not want to do much with the Bush administration because uh, conservative Republicans. Although I will say that you know, the uh, Gates Foundation um, team had, I think, great affection and alignment with Margaret Spellings, and so I would question the, the, your informant's um, claims there a little bit. I think the larger point uh, is, and I hesitate, but I think it's, I'll do it. I, I think um, it's important to, Remember, this is back to the human behavior thing and the living donor question. While it's true that the staff was largely, uh, I think, predominantly progressive, I think Bill and, Bill and Melinda um, are um, uh, kind of less identified clearly in that way. And it's important to remember that a seminal uh, event in their lives was being sued by a Democratic <laughs> Department of Justice on antitrust uh, violations at Microsoft uh, in the 90s under the Clinton administration. And while that doesn't carry through into their grant making, I mean, Joel Klein was the prosecutor. Um, uh, $150 million flowed to the small school effort uh, from the Gates Foundation into his highest strategic priority that happened to be aligned. And so I think there is something quite nice and large and expansive about a, a view of shared priorities and the willingness to overlook um, maybe personal uh, um, uh, grievances and um, uh, incidents of the past. I, I do think it, it just bears um, remembering that sometimes the caricatures we have of you know, a, a fully liberal institution not wanting to work with a Republican administration and therefore when the Democrats were in power all these dollars started flowing to shared pr priorities uh, is, worth, um, is worth examining. The last thing I'll say, I know I'm out of time, I think, can I start with the incidents? Yeah, so, uh, so Anjay's, look, I, I, I am in general very um, uh, consistent with Jay's insights. I think the important insight about constituencies either already in place or that get created by the nature of the grant making itself so that somebody other than the program officers uh, and principals and policy makers actually care about what's going on is quite important and a good push forward, Jay, of, of your original work. The other thing I would say um, that's uh, related to this, kind of back to the market question um, of a capital market is, um, you know, one thing that the, the team at the New Schools Venture Fund has said for a long time um, is that, you know, the best ideas are out there, not in here. 
And while we might have shared priorities, we're looking for great people with terrific ideas that can create change, not trying to create an agenda and put money to work to try to get people to do that thing. I think there's something very powerful about that, not nearly often enough considered by philanthropists with really significant amounts of money to, um, to deploy, uh, to, to actually kind of raise up a set of priorities they're interested in and look for the best ideas to fund versus having a very tight set of cri criteria that they're willing to fund against. On this informant thing, I know I'm way over, on this informant issue, I think this is a real challenge, um, Sarah, actually, and, and um, I'm, I'm assuming you couldn't get these folks to let you quote them mm -hmm. by name, and I think it's a real, um, I, I think it's a real challenge. Um, I, some, of, some of what uh, I see is quoted, at least in my own experience, doesn't resonate. Um, I never worked at the Broad Foundation, so I don't know if those quotes do, but I, I would just say, you know, part of this becoming a private meeting today versus a more, more public meeting and the need, f people feeling the need to be anonymous or confidential sources. Um, I don't know what to, it's, by the way, this is not a critique of you or your, uh. Uh, your approach. I just think that's something larger that we've, we've got to figure out what that's about because I, I say Jay thinks they're not as nearly as powerful as they think they are, we perceive them to be, and somehow people who have worked there in the past and don't work there anymore are reluctant to be named um, as they discuss what their experiences inside their life. There's something, I think, um, uh, challenging and, and disturbing going on uh, related to that. So I'll stop there. Well, I, mean, I think part of it is, you know, they may not be as powerful as where they think they are in terms of shaping what happens in the nation's schools and classrooms, but they're very powerful in terms of us being able to feed our families and kind of do the research yeah. <laughs> and analysis we'd like to do. <laughs> I understand. And so there is. Uh, but no, I think it's great. Um, and like I said uh, at the beginning, A, uh, these guys really just gave kind of the Super Bowl 30-second spot of, I think, some really thoughtful papers. Uh, make sure you avail yourself of the papers. Uh, we are doing this as an intimate meeting, but it is certainly an on-the-record conversation. We're being live-streamed. It'll be available on the web. Uh, so feel free to rate about it, to, uh, you know, um, Mike, to tweet, if you're so moved. <laughs> uh, these yeah. kinds of things. Um, but with that, let's actually go ahead and take it out. And part of this is I'm going to relax my usual rule about 15 seconds to ask a question. We'd really like this to be more of a conversation. So if you'd like to share a comment, if you do want to ask a question, whatever moves you, please be kind enough to just identify yourself by name and affiliation. And if you, whether you're asking a question or sharing a comment, let's keep them on the pithy side. Um, the last thing any of us want to sit through is a whole bunch of floor monologues. That is just going to bore the living heck out of us, and I'll put an end to that. Um, we've got a mics going around. Uh, catch Elizabeth Eye, catch Isaac Eye, and let's, uh, let's hear what folks think. Uh, Tom in the back, Elizabeth. Thanks, Rick, and thanks uh, for the panelists. This is a really interesting conversation. Just a quick. Oh, just introduce yourself, Tom. For Tom Talk with the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. So the the first observation is just a quick point of clarification. In in your paper, Sarah, you <laughs> refer to the Carnegie Foundation. Uh, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching is an operating foundation. Uh, and maybe it's Jeffrey's paper. Oh. Sorry, uh, but uh, it doesn't give grants. The Carnegie Corporation of New York. Uh, is a grant-making uh, organization, so you probably want to refer to it as the Carnegie Corp, not the Carnegie Foundation. Um, so my, uh, the conversation raises lots of really interesting topics and, and provokes uh, many questions. Um, so I'll just ask one uh, of Jay. Um, you seem to imply, Jay, that, that ideas don't matter as much as we in the, in the policy community, uh, in the ideas business, would like to believe. So why do you think that the Walton Foundation uh, has invested as heavily as it has in, in creating your shop, the University of uh, Arkansas, and maybe Jim Blue, who, who I think had something to do with that uh, in his time at Walton, could answer as well. Thanks. Sure. Well, as long as we're in the correction business, um, the Walton Family Foundation actually did not create my department. Um, my no, uh, they actually didn't. Um, my department was created uh, with a $10 million gift from the Wingate Foundation that was matched by the university's matching grant foundation, which came from, a decade earlier, uh, the estate of Sam Walton. Um, so um, actually, the driving force was a gift from the Wingate Foundation. In any event, why, why, does, why does Walton invest in ideas? Well. Um, I think um, 
they don't that much. I mean, two thirds of the 1,400 grants that my research assistants coded with high rates of intercoder reliability. Sorry, I didn't get to that part of the talk. Um, <laughs> uh, two thirds of those grants uh, from all of these foundations, two thirds of those dollars basically go to uh, non self sustaining programs. Uh, programs that don't create constituents, or advocacy that doesn't create constituents, basically mercenaries. Um, and so uh, that's where most of it goes. I'm not saying that ideas can't matter. I'm just saying that, that uh, you need both ideas and people uh, who have an interest in making those ideal, ideas policy. And so the tension you know, that, that we talked about here between Sarah's paper and my paper um, is I think foundations have been fairly effective at getting uh, people to talk about teacher quality issues, um, and we're all talking about it. Um, and, uh, and we even are adopting policies uh, regarding it, but actually implementing it has turned out to be nearly impossible. I, I'd wager that fewer than 100 teachers in the entire country have lost their jobs um, you know, out of a working a workforce of 3.2 million, uh, have have lost their jobs as a result of any of this stuff. Uh, I'd 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 even wager it's probably less than than 10. But um, it just doesn't. It's 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 a largely toothless thing. I mean, we we're going through this enormous exercise, spending a lot of energy measuring a lot of stuff, and then ultimately we get Chicago. You know, where the teachers go on strike and they eviscerate the whole thing. It's amazing how, and, and so Randy Weingarten will appear on the panel and she'll say, yeah, I think we, you know, she's, she's smart enough to understand that, that, that she can give lip service to this stuff and then eviscerate it when it's necessary. And so my concern is the foundations have just not been that politically savvy. Um, and I'm not saying that ideas don't matter, but, they, but you need the, the effective politics to go with it. And I do think that prior generations weren't just like the current one. I think they were actually more politically savvy. They created constituents. Chase. And I don't think the current foundations are doing a very good job of that. And just to clarify something, because you've, you, you've made the reference a couple of times, you know, hired mercenary mm. kind of right. analogy. Um, just to help folks make sure they understand how you're seeing and thinking about mm -hmm. this, what are some of the organizations or groups that, you, that, that in your mind are kind of those mercenaries? Right now, I, I, let me be clear. I don't. I, I agree with Stacy. I don't think people are being insincere. I, I don't think people are having their ideas changed. Um, but I think people wish to be relevant, and so they'll talk about what is being funded, um, and they'll talk less about things that are not being funded. So the conversation can be bought. Um, and I think you know those organizations are, are you know virtually all the DC groups. You know, you you can get that conversation uh, relatively easily, um, and you can have lots of, you know, acronym organizations. Uh, you know, there's an, an an alphabet soup of them. Um, I, I I just think that you know, let, let's look at at what the effectiveness of the whole teacher quality effort has been. What has actually happened in the world, um, and, and I think a very, very little, and that's what I want people to, to, to think about. Now, it may be, I, I ha, I'm not saying whether um, trying to measure teacher effectiveness and drive uh, teacher behavior in different directions, I don't know whether that's good or bad. All I know is that it's not a promising strategy for foundations, um, and it may just be inherent in that, in that policy approach. It's ironic that the Gates Foundation was behind small schools uh, which not only has been supported by research as effective, um, but actually was something that created constituents. I mean, they built new schools and people were in them and then people will fight for them once they're in them. That's, that's how you create constituents. So they, I think the Gates Foundation actually shifted from a self-sustaining strategy into a non-self-sustaining strategy. Uh, okay, go ahead, Elizabeth. Mike, Mike. Hi, I'm Dana Goldstein. I'm a journalist. Jay, I agree with much, if not most, of what you're saying. I want to push back a little bit against the assumption that 100 or fewer than 10 teachers have lost their jobs. I mean, if you look at a place like St. Louis, it's 7% of the teaching force. In New Haven, it's 1% to 2% annually. Have what? Have, have lost their jobs due to being declared ineffective under these new evaluation programs that have been in large part 
you know, as we're going to discuss all day today, and I'm going to discuss more with my paper, incentivized by the convergence of federal policy and the foundation priority. So I do think this shift has led to real world impact for teachers and systems. Mike? Mike needs the mic. Mike Usedan from the Institute for Educational Leadership. I spent uh, two decades hustling dollars uh, from the, the old foundations. And a word that has not been used in all of the discussion thus far is the, the, the whole notion of sustainability. And it really relates to uh, a lot of what Jay has said. And I think it would be terribly important to try to cull from this discussion today prototypes or examples of sustainability. With all the grants I was able to get in two decades, there was very little sustainability. And I've had my life to live over again. I, I would do things very, very differently. What are the examples of sustainability? There have to be some foundation investments that have at least a modicum of sustainability. And Mike, what, what, clarify what you mean by sustainability. What's that mean to you? Well, you know, uh, without sounding proprietary, uh, Ford Foundation created my organization back in 1964, and we're still floating. I mean, I'm retired for 14 years, which is probably the reason they're still floating. But uh, uh, in any event, that's what I mean by sustainability. So, but, but if we think about, so for instance, if, uh, some of the stuff that Sarah and Jeff were portraying, so... Uh, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the densely funded organizations, Teach for Americas, KIPPs, uh, TNTPs of the world. So these guys are 10, 15, 20 odd years. And is that what you have in mind by sustainability? Well, yeah, certainly I think TFA has proven its sustainability and its growth. Uh, whatever the criteria are, I think what ought to be built into the discussion is the development of a set of criteria and definitions of sustainability. Can I ask Mike a clarifying question? Yeah. I'm trying. So the examples Rick just gave makes me understand your question a little differently than I thought I did. So um, I thought what you meant was organizations that eventually wouldn't need philanthropy. That that, would, that, that would be independent. That would be independent, self-sustaining somehow on other flows of. Well, that would be a very important element. Money. Okay. Examples of that, I think. Because be all of Rick's examples don't. That's right. <laughs> Meet that. Who are not totally dependent on on on, on okay. breathing, if you will, in terms of continued philanthropy. Thank Stacey, you. I mean, how, how do you guys think about this, and how did you think about this in your time? Yeah, in it's it's a tough question, and so actually, it, it's it, it is in some ways linked to to Jay's first uh, buckets in the sea, and um, and now his his additional insight about constituencies, which is. Um, you know, with philanthropy, even pretty big money being tiny, tiny money relative to the public dollars that get spent on K-12, tiny money even related to the annual growth <laughs> in K-12 public spending, um, you know, finding ways to deploy philanthropic capital um, to organizations who eventually over some time period will be supported on the public dollars. So that's the, you know, hope uh, in the charter school example where at some point because of student enrollment and student funding, uh, those entities ought to be sustainable, at least at least operationally in a you know site to site um, uh, way, on uh, the same dollars the local public school gets you know from from tax revenues. So that's an example of sustainability. As they're growing, they continue to raise philanthropy, just as a company would continue to go to the capital markets to raise growth capital, even if they had plenty of revenue. Um, but I, so I think it's it's a real interesting question uh, for things like Teach for America and. Uh, TNTP and others that don't have some natural revenue base out there from the public sector to support them and what the notion of sustainability looks like. Some of the work that some of the new philanthropies are doing and some of the work I did at Gates is actually focused on the education technology markets. You can make some huge mistakes there by funding things that nobody really cares about and are only paying attention to them because you're willing to put ph philanthropic dollars behind them even though it's a commercial. Uh, offering and the you know the the hard work of thinking how to design um, uh, grant making activities in ways that help strengthen the commercial market. Um, so let me ask you, really let me stop here for yeah. a sec. So I'd love to hear you and Jay and Sarah and Jeff. So, so for instance, um, you wrote a wonderful paper for me and Michael Horn uh, a, a couple years back about how yeah. philanthropy when it when it hurts and when it undercuts um, entrepreneurial activity. I'm curious in Jay's Uber example, yeah. would Uber be worse off? 
If Uber had gotten an initial large grant from a foundation that wanted to create alternative urban transportation alternatives, and they had spent a lot of time organizing and doing lobby, and rather than rather than being forced into the strategy that Jay characterizes, would they be worse off? Would they? Would, would Uber be? Would, would would we benefit less from Uber today if foundations had played that role in helping Uber get started? Uber would be worse off. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it would be have, have completely buffered them from the market test uh, of demand from people who actually wanted to pay to use it. And therefore, had not would not have developed a constituency of, peop, constituency of people who valued it because they and by and signaled that by paying for it in you know droves in cities all over the world. That now, as the regulatory you know vice is coming down on the company, not only is Uber fighting, um, uh, but the constituency of customers who have come to rely on uh, Uber are fighting for it. So I I think the buffer of early stage organizations from some kind of market mechanism that indicates somebody's receiving value that they really actually value <laughs> from that thing um, is, um, it, it, it's, it's, again, it's not nefarious, I think it's just overlooked. I think you know, philanthropists just aren't always thinking about that dynamic when they're, uh, when they're funding things. I, I agree, also middle, an, an important part uh, of what foundations might have done to harm Uber in addition to minimizing the effect of the market test and not getting them to work to develop constituents as much is it probably would have redirected their energy um, away from middle and upper middle class constituents, which is their bread and butter. And the hard reality is that those people have more political power. And so the the fight uh, over regulation is uh, Uber is, is strengthened by the fact that they have, you know, cool, hip, young, upper middle class folks um, uh, lobbying for them. And now, of course, working class folks benefit because there now is cheaper, better transportation available for everyone. Um, uh, but it's important that, that, that upper middle class people were part of that constituency. One of the things that I think we have to watch out for in the philanthropic world is that we, in our correct eagerness to help people with less money, um, we sometimes fail to cultivate constituencies among the middle and upper middle class who are more politically powerful. Mm. Hello, Mike Petrilli from Fordham. Just real quickly, back to this question about you know the groups being influenced by the funders. I mean, don't you think the, the uh, relationship can go the other direction as well? I mean, in the case of teacher evaluation, it seemed like it was, you know, TNTP came out with this uh, widget uh, report and suddenly everybody got on that bandwagon. I mean, that was an example of the funders following the lead of a group. So I guess the question would be, does, does, this, does this stuff go both ways? That some of these groups, some of the think tanks and other groups actually influence uh, the way the funders think and what their priorities might be? Mm. Uh, well, the widget effect report received a lot of foundation funding to be done. <laughs> so um, uh, I think there, there was a degree to which uh, the agenda was already driving that way, um, and they were well positioned to keep that momentum going. Uh, I don't know, Jim, I, I'd be, uh, oh, Joanne, go ahead. Oh, I was going to start on a whole. Oh, so Jim, I would, just be, I would just be curious on this point, having, having had the experiences you've had over the years. Uh, have, you, have you found, particularly in your time at Walton, where places where some of this advocacy or research wound up shaping investment priorities at a foundation? Yeah, I would say Mike's question is right on target. It's much, much more often the other way around. Um, uh, we're, we were part of, quote, the funding of the widget uh, effect. We were, um, but we did not actually know what the report was going mm -hmm. to say. We knew that TNTP was beginning to think differently about uh, teacher effectiveness, and we wanted to see what they could produce. And so absolutely, their report affected mm -hmm. our foundation and I think the whole space. And to, to suggest that it's actually the other way around, I don't think there's any evidence for that. Joanne? I don't know if this is working well. I'm gonna try not to use it. Can you hear me? Use it. Uh, use it, okay. Um, I just wanted to make three very brief comments about Jay's paper. Uh, first, um, the point about public school districts or the public school system isn't really 
waiting for that grant money and that the grant money isn't, you know, so huge for them. What I was really struck to with Race to the Top, and I realized that that's government uh, money, not foundation money, is there was just four or five billion dollars involved. It was spread out across the country, you know, through the states, through the districts. And what always struck me is this is a tiny amount of money. And yet it had a huge change in terms of charter school regulations and in terms of teacher evaluation. So maybe when I finish these other two comments, you could make a comment about that. And um, then about the gate small schools. Uh, I think that there's evidence that small schools that are started from the ground up, you know, by teachers, by parents, groups of uh, parents and teachers together, can function very well. I wonder if part of the reason that the Gates Foundation didn't get the results that it wanted, perhaps as fast as uh, they wanted, is the more top-down approach, which might have created a lot of resistance at the, at, the, at the ground level. And perhaps it took a while for some of those schools then to develop their own roots in the community. And the final thing is just about what has happened to teachers. I think that actually this evaluation system has influenced teachers tremendously. I think they're demoralized. I think that teaching to the test is a result, result of that. I think tons of time on um, test prep is part of that. Um, and there's just a general fear among teachers. I don't see any of that as being good for public education or teachers, but I do think it's a result of the evaluation systems. Right, so uh, thanks for those comments. I think your third point helps explain the first point, um, which is that uh, in the midst of a great economic downturn where states were stressed in their budgets, and they were told if only they would say these words, say these words, and money is available. And they'll say, okay, I say the words. And they said it, and they got the money. But the problem is, how do you produce actual enduring change in schools and classrooms? That's the problem. So, you know, they, they swore they'd do a bunch of things, many of which they then didn't do. Um, or did, and now w the third thing you're noting is all the blowback that occurs that's going to undo a lot of it and probably do undo even more um, than, than what was originally pledged in the race to the top. Um, and so uh, it's, it's really hard. I mean, you, again, even getting states to swear that they'll do things is, is buying conversation, not buying enduring change. Um, your second point again was what? Oh, small schools. All I know is MDRC did a gold standard random assignment study that showed that really great results, actually. Um, and uh, I don't know whether New York City was top down, bottom up, or whatever. All I know is that it worked, and, uh, but Gates ditched it even before finding out whether it worked. Um, and, and this could be a hazard of living donors. I mean, may, I don't know, maybe Bill Gates woke up w one morning and had something different for breakfast and changed his mind. I don't know. I don't know what caused the change, but, um, but it wasn't driven by evidence. Uh, Can so, I just add something sure. to that? Um, I don't disagree with anything that you said. I think they're really important points. My, um, my comment was more that, from my point of view, a relatively small amount of money can at least buy those words. I thought you had implied more that the small amount of money just didn't matter, they would ignore it. I think they're really willing to talk the talk for that little bit of money. Mm -hmm. can, yes. Uh, so I, I think there's, so the, the question about that included race to the top, I think this is kind of a consistency actually between uh, Sarah and Jay's paper, even though they say it a little differently, the, the frame is a little different. I think this is really, really important and we haven't talked about it explicitly yet. Um, or Jay was just getting at it, which is I think a big lesson for me, uh, both as a practicing philanthropist for four years and then reading these papers and thinking about today, a, a big lesson to kind of get into here is the um, kind of the, uh, the seductiveness of fast wins. And you know, so race to the top did move teacher evaluation conversations in states 
certainly. Um, and also, I think it, it's, it would be disingenuous to say it didn't enormously accelerate the adoption of, of Common Core, even though it didn't name Common Core. It said college and career ready internationally benchmark standards, and states that didn't want to spend years re um, creating their own had an incentive to, to adopt the new Common Core standards, which is a huge win from a policy perspective. I mean, I, you know, I, I know that the uh, Gates Foundation projections of how fast that would go, I think we'd currently be at 15 or 20 states would have adopted Common Core in the original kind of expectations. And then, you know, literally within a few months, it was in the 40s. Um, and it's the seeds of its uh, really deep, deep, deep challenges now, as the as Sarah points out on page three, I think second most <laughs> important quote in your paper, is that um, it, it bypassed the real and very important uh, local and state level public debates among various constituencies about the value and wisdom of um, adopting something very important, which is the statement of what our kids need to know and be able to do. And while it could have all gone swimmingly when the blowback started, there really wasn't a, a very strong political constituency for it outside you know, a couple of key actors in states who have, some of whom have weathered the storm so far, some of which have been you know, lost elections or, or uh, had to resign and, and those kinds of things. And I think the, see, again, the seductiveness of that very quick win on some really complex stuff uh, meant that people, the foundations and others weren't paying attention to all of the things that got missed um, in what would normally be a, a more uh, extended set of public conversations. So I think it's really important. Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to jump in on one thing. I think that uh, the that alignment in our paper with Federal Department of Ed, Gates, and Broad, you know, it speaks to that, that that enabled some things to move more quickly than they might have otherwise and is also a really important context for some of the quotes that people in kind of a heady moment yeah. <laughs> um, that that they they see things happening maybe quicker more quickly than they would have expected and it does give this sense of oh we're having influence what's happening and you know feeling feeling that way about that moment but then maybe a few years later having some reflection on it as a Good morning. Arnie Fagey with Public Advocacy for Kids. First, I want to thank the panel for a fascinating discussion. I'd like to focus on this debate question, Stacey, that you brought up, but Jay, that you also brought up. And I'm a, I'm a writer of thousands of proposals from everything to Ford to Gates Foundation. And it, it appears that, and I'm not quite clear if it's an institutional inadequacy or it is a self-righteousness, but uh, it, uh, th this issue of debate, this issue of uh, community discussion doesn't fly when you write proposals. And when you score proposals, and I've written many to Gates, it, it, it appears as though either there's an antagonism uh, around uh, these programs, whether it's Common Core, whether it's teacher evaluation, or whether it's small schools. And I agree with you, I thought small schools was on its way. And then Gates changed the agenda. I think that's what Mike Usdan was talking about. Every, every so often, Gates changes the agenda. What is it about the, inst the new foundations that, um, uh, and Jay, you, you, you really hit on the new constituency. What is it that we can't have the debate first uh, and that programs emanate from the debate rather than this top-down sort of self-righteousness Silver Bullet uh, program. I'm working on a. Well, are the, are, so just to, and just to clarify what you're yep. suggesting. So, are, are you suggesting that if you, when you write to these foundations and a proposal, that hey, there is disagreement on this? Are you saying that that you have found to be a an obstacle to funding, or exact what when you, what exactly are you characterizing? I, I found it that foundations resist. Uh, going to the community first rather than moving stuff from the top down. Uh, and that there is a, there seems to be, uh, at least in my experiences, um, a, let's say Common Core, that, all, that we just propose Common Core and the local community will automatically buy it. Testing is another good example. In each of these areas now we've got a lot of backlash, which I'm presuming, and I don't know, that Gates or other foundations that proposed these didn't think there was going to be a backlash, that they thought that the country was going to buy it, that, that they had the, the, the silver bullet, and that we were well on our way. 
there, there doesn't appear that this debate issue, I think, is really an important issue to Stacey. get at. Well, the, the only, th I mean, just a quick reaction to a piece of that, and then I'm sure people have lots to say, but um, I, my own experience inside the very large institution, the Gates Foundation, isn't that folks necessarily thought this is just going to fly and there's not going to be any debate and everybody will just, you know, get on board. It's, it's more that kind of recognizing, you know, to some of Jay and Sarah's point, recognizing where they sit in the overall context of, you know, policymakers and implement, you know, practitioners, and that, you know, somebody else has got the ball on building the constituency, right? So if, if you're funding the chief state school officers association that has a bunch of members who are state chiefs who are saying they're on board with Common Core teacher evaluation. The, the, the people providing the capital are, are making an assumption that those actors are um, cultivating, to the degree that you know, support needs to be cultivated, that they are doing the work in their states with their legislatures and their constituents to actually build whatever support they need to get the work done. Less about the Gates Foundation has an idea, let's pay state chiefs to, um, uh, implement it and who needs to build constituencies because, you know, we can just get this done. I, I just think that's not, it's a nice story and headline, I think, and, and you know, kind of contributes to some of the conspiracy um, blogs and, and journalism about this issue. But I just don't, I, it just doesn't comport with reality and how people really behave. I think, I just imagine that if we're funding at the state level, the folks in the states are going to take care of all of these issues of constituency building, not really our role. It's their role. They're their constituents. Now, it might be misguided, but I think just in terms of what the thinking is and the motivation is. I do think there's always a ta challenge with top-down anything. That's my own. Um, but, uh, you know, and I, I agree. I, I think, look, for the most part, I'm willing to believe these folks are good people and they want good things. Um, but as Stacy pointed out, I think they're in a hurry. Uh, and that impatience is a major flaw. And they also may suffer a bit from overconfidence that they've, they're smart, they're smart people, they've been told they're smart throughout their lives, they're very successful. And so they, they may, from that, develop an overconfidence that they can figure things out better than, the, than they can. Um, but frankly, it has to come, it can't just uh, come from the community all the way up. Uber doesn't say, you know, I wonder if people have an idea for how we might change transportation. No, they, they say, we have an idea of how it might work. Let's try it out. Let's see if people like it. And if they like it, let's see if we can get them on board. And then when there's a fight with the local regulators, we'll, they'll be on our side and we'll write letters and emails and, and we stand a chance to win. And I think the, the, the problem, though, is trusting that other people um, have the same investment in, in developing constituents. I'm um, going to a DC organization that is the representative of, of state school chiefs um, is like five times removed from actual people in the world. Um, you know, so, and uh, so that, I mean, that, it, that's a problem. Uh, all right, we're just about time. Uh, Sarah, Jeff, final word, and then we'll wrap the panel. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll, well, I'll give one uh, additional point on this, this last question about um, sort of driving the agenda and goals and pitch my co-author Megan's work um, where she compares Gates and Broad to um, Ford and Kellogg, getting at this new versus old. And, and there are some real interesting differences that emerge um, about sort of how these foundations view the political process um, and that Ford and Kellogg ha do take more of approach of we see the process play out. We empower some groups to be part of that. Um, and a bit more of a goal setting mentality that you see at, at Gates and Broad that you'd link to something like you know, the, there's the phrase strategic philanthropy. Um, and that, I think that difference plays out in the fact that, well, we're talking a lot about the influence of Gates and Broad and maybe not about Ford uh, right now. Mm. Jeff? And I think this point Stacy made um, and Mike used in, uh, to some extent as well, that, you know, the old foundations were investing in the disruptors of their time, that my, you know, narrow cut of the data is now showing them as the traditional actors. I think that's an important point that uh, I know I definitely certainly need to revisit in my paper a bit. Great. I'd like to thank you guys for a terrific conversation. A terrific start to the day. We're going to break for 15 and come back to talk about uh, philanthropy and its discontents. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, okay. <laughs> we're going to get our, our 
second session started. Rick's a tough taskmaster, and we're going to try to stay on time, as he suggested. Uh, we uh, heard during the break that the live streaming is not operating right now. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing various conspiracy theories, <laughs> either the Koreans or some kind of collaborative effort between between the Gates Foundation and Diane Ravitch. <laughs> uh, so, so you're all triply blessed to be here uh, uh, for the panel, including the folks in the back. <laughs> Quite a... Okay, every, um, Rick uh, tells me that everything is being uh, taped, so this will be online tomorrow if they don't get the live streaming going today. So it's not... It's not lost, but you own it for the day. So I'm really pleased to have this second panel. I just want to quickly say that when Rick and I started talking about some of this, uh, we wrestled with and other people raised to us the question, is there really something new here? You know, people would say, well, what, you know, I mean, Ford's been, you know, Ford was involved in education and, and advocacy and other foundations were too. And I think this first panel was really useful. Uh, in, in suggesting both that there's some complexity to that issue and Stacy's point about what were the old foundations like when they were new, I think is really interesting on that. But the empirical work in the, in the papers, uh, the, uh, the first panel and some of the others that you'll hear from does suggest clearly that there is also something new and certainly a different uh, set of strategies being pursued by some of the newer foundations. And that's good from the standpoint of this panel, because this panel is about criticisms, and it's hard to be critical of something if it doesn't exist. So we've established there's something there, and now we're going to hear some views about um, how we should think of that. We have uh, uh, two papers um, represented on this panel. At the, my far right is um, Michael McShane, who with Jen Hatfield, who's a research assistant here at AEI has uh, written a paper on the backlash against reform philanthropy, and their work, as they'll explain, is based on interviews with a wide range of, of, of critics. Uh, Mike's a research fellow in the education policy uh, studies at AEI, co-editor of the Common Core Meets Education Reform, co-author of President Obama and Education Reform, the Personal and the Political. And he started his career as an inner city high school teacher in Montgomery, Alabama. So he's come a long way. <laughs> um, Larry, Cube, Larry Cuban, I'm going to jump to present the two paper presenters first. Larry Cuban in the middle uh, is, uh, has drafted a paper called A Thoughtful Critique of Contemporary Education Giving. I'll let him explain why his is thoughtful and some others aren't. <laughs> um, <laughs> Larry, is, <laughs> many of you know, is professor emeritus at Stanford University, uh, has been extremely influential through the years. His recent books include Inside the Black Box, Change Without Reform in the Classroom. Uh, and uh, he also previously worked as a high school social studies teacher and district superintendent. We have two commentators on, on the uh, uh, papers. I think after the papers, I'm going to first ask uh, Howard Fuller to talk. He's distinguished professor of education at Marquette University, the founder and director of the Institute for the Transformation of Learning at Marquette. Um, I just learned that he's stepped down or stepping down. Uh, from the Black Alliance and Educational Opportunity, uh, an influential organization in many of these issues. Uh, and he was superintendent of schools, of Milwaukee public schools, from 1991 to 1995. And Joanne Barkin, uh, uh, our second discussant, is writer and member of the editorial board of Dissent magazine. Her work uh, and writing focuses on philanthropy and democracy, private foundations, and the effort to remake public education. And uh, among her writings is also a book, Visions of Emancipation, <laughs> the Italian Workers' Movement since 1945, as well as, and I'm going to say this, but I mean, I don't know what to make of it, as well as several books for young readers. So <laughs> she'll, she'll make sure that she presents everything in simple terms that we can understand. <laughs> 
Uh, so, Mike, you want to start us off? Sure, well? absolutely. Thank you so much, and thanks for uh, having me this morning. I was tasked by uh, our editors of this volume, along with Jen Hatfield, who, a woman of many talents, who also organized this whole conference, uh, who uh, authored this paper, with me to look at the backlash to what we call education reform philanthropy, much of the conversation today. Should the PowerPoint choose to cooperate with me? Oh, there we go. Okay, the backlash against education reform philanthropy. And so even if you are a sort of casual observer of education discussions, it's hard to avoid criticisms, reading criticisms, seeing criticisms of um, educational philanthropic efforts. Now, these show up sometimes from the right of the political spectrum. Here's something about from red state. They come from the left of the political spectrum. Why are Walmart billionaires bankrolling phony school reform in LA? And so part of what uh, I was interested in finding was in least some way could we quantify the amount of backlash that is happening or the amount that it's trickled into public consciousness and then also to talk to some of the people that are promised and, uh, prominent critics of educational philanthropy and understand a very simple question which is why why did they um why are they uh, so critical of these efforts? So we started first by, uh, and I'll say that this is, this is a very difficult topic to kind of quantify, to try and count you know, negative criticism or the amounts that, that is trickled into the public consciousness. So we tried a couple different strategies. But first, just, just a very brief sort of historical look. Like, is this new? Like, is, is criticism of philanthropy new? And you know, it really isn't. Um, if we talk, Jay, I know, spoke in the first panel about the Rosenwald Fund. Well, when the Rosenwald Fund was building schools all across um, the South, back where I used to live, um, there was pushback from the KKK. Um, worked in, in things that are I just realized now I juxtaposed Checker Finn and the KKK, which I didn't really mean to necessarily do there. Sorry there. Sorry, Checker. Um, no, so uh, that's so the KKK with the Rosenwald schools. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, we have the 1968 uh, teachers' riots in New York. Um, a lot of the precipitate of, of that came from uh, the Ford Foundation's work in local control. So there was a lot of pushback at that time against the Ford Foundation. And then I have Checker up there when the uh, when the Annenberg Foundation was doing the Annenberg Challenge. He wrote some uh, critical things saying you're just kind of pouring more money into a system that isn't working. So so on a certain level, this is not new criticism of, of philanthropy, but it has a sort of different feel now with the advent of social media, it can seem to sort of seep in more. So uh, one thing that we just wanted to start by doing is just look at the overall amount of coverage that educational philanthropies have seen in the last 15 or so years. And if you look, it's kind of difficult because the Gates Foundation is so huge that it messes up our y-axis. But there has been an incredible growth in the amount of coverage from the Gates Foundation, the Walton Foundation, the Broad Foundation, and the Arnold Foundation. Um, while they look kind of small and close to the x-axis there, there in the bottom, um, they actually went from back in 2000, about 20 mentions nationally to over 200, between 200 and 300 um, mentions in, in newspapers across country. And we use Lexis now access for, for, for this search. Um, the other thing we wanted to look at was the proportion of this coverage that is that we could describe as negative. So the first thing that we did was kind of a rough estimation tool, where if in this first graph we looked and simply searched uh, using LexisNexis of the name of the foundation and education and counted up the number of responses that we got, we actually were able to pair the research terms here with words that are clearly associated with criticism. So they're in the paper, but it's words like plot, subvert, destroy, um, many of the things that are more in there. And if you actually notice, um, we have seen a growth in the proportion of articles back around 2000, about 3% of articles associated with education foundations contain those other words. Um, in our most recent look in 2013, it's up to 6%. And it's also important to realize um, that the overall number of articles is much larger too. So not only is there as a higher percentage of articles written, but there's also just more articles um, that this came from. But that was just sort of one strategy. And again, you know, it's kind of a rough estimate because it's just pairing these terms together with one another. So we wanted to do a slightly deeper dive to get a better understanding of how this works. So what we actually did was went back to our sample of all of the articles written about these foundations from 2000 to 2013. And we um, coded all of them. We, I'm sorry. We took a sample of them, about 1% of the articles from the Gates Foundation, 2% from Walton and Broad, and about 10% of the Arnold Foundation articles. We end up with about 300 from this time period. And we coded them. Um, a one was uh, an extremely harshly critical um, account. 
Uh, a five was a glowing account, and a three was just a sort of just the facts. This is something that that one of these uh, philanthropic organizations did. Um, you know, one indication uh, I think you know number one, uh, an article that would fall into number one was uh, I think one was like the Broad Foundation is a Trojan horse in our local schools. Um, a number five, um, uh, one there's a quote in the paper where an individual said something like the Gates Foundation is giving is so magnificent, it is like Mount Rainier. It washes over you, and I can't remember, I can't do it justice, but it was something about the magnificence of Mount Rainier uh, washing over you. I've been to Seattle, it is beautiful. Um, so two things to note about this, uh, or a couple things really to note about this that we found interesting. So if you'll notice the modal, or the most common form was just number, was a number three, which are just factual articles. Right? The Gates Foundation did X. The Walton Foundation did Y. Um, but the second most common were, were ones that we kind of coded as sort of gently positive in the sense that uh, it would include language, something like the Gates Foundation funded X to increase college enrollment or whatever. So it highlighted the sort of positive factions. Um, there was less of that sort of Mount Rainier washing over you stuff. But also, if you look to the ones and twos, so um, harshly critical and moderately critical articles, if you count all of these up, they actually end up about 13% of our sample. So anywhere from 3%, 60%, 13% is about the, uh, about the amount that it's trickled in. On average, the average code for the whole thing was about 32 so on the whole, articles appear to tend slightly positive in their description of philanthropic efforts, but there is a sort of substantial group uh, down there uh, on the left-hand tail of both harshly critical and sort of moderately critical articles. So then we had actually a really fun, uh, we went into the sample also to try and figure out where on the political spectrum is this coming from? Is this from the right? Is it from the left? Or is it sort of just a general criticism um, of it? Um, you can see the, the, the findings that we have here. The majority fell into what we would define as a sort of neutral criticism, which would be an article that was critical of an action that a philanthropic organization took and then sort of cited people from both sides of the political spectrum sort of agreeing with that. Some of these articles that were from the right end of the political spectrum um, sort of only cited people from right-leaning think tanks or other organizations, and again, some from the left um, were the same. Uh, we'll see most of the criticism that you find in here uh, in the total is from the right, because the Gates Foundation sort of piece of the sample was so much larger. Most of the criticism from the Gates Foundation came from the right, therefore that sort of affected the overall numbers. So then what we actually did was uh, we talked to the folks. Right? So we, we uh, were able to arrange some interviews, and we tried to find people that had been critical of philanthropic efforts from across the political spectrum. Right? So we found some people who identify on the political left. We were able to talk to Diane Ravitch, um, who was actually helpful with some of the history that we talked about, and I really appreciate her taking the time. Um, Lainey Hameson, Mark Nason, the founder of the Badass Teachers. Um, he's on there, too. Um, we found uh, Mike, maybe things we never thought would be said at AEI up here, the badass teachers. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the center of the spectrum, Michael Mazenko, who's a teacher and blogger out in Colorado who describes himself as sort of a, as a political moderate. Um, and on the right end of the spectrum, Joy Pullman and Emmett McGrory, um, both from the Heartland Institute American Principles Project. Well, we actually... Um, Organize, to me, the best way to sort of understand what, what they said was kind of organized around the classic sort of journalist questions. So why they have a problem with, with philanthropic organizations, kind of it's because of what they do, how they do it, who they are, where they do it, and why. So, I mean, the key thing that we heard kind of over and over again uh, and why it's at the top is sort of the what. Right? So most of these people disagree with the reforms that that particular organization um, supports, and therefore they have a problem with that organization. Right? So it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. If you don't like school vouchers and, and you feel the Walton, Foundation, Walton Family Foundation is supporting school vouchers, you don't like the Walton Fa Family Foundation. Um, but there were some other actual interesting pieces here, and the same was for, for some of our right-leaning folks that we talked to about the Common Core. But there were some other some, uh, some issues that, that I found very interesting. Um, the who and the where playing out, where folks feeling that these philanthropic organizations were outsiders that were coming into their communities and trying to sort of impose their will on them. How feeling that it um, subverted democracy. Uh, and part of it, too, was just the why, that um, met most of the people that we talked to don't really feel that the public school system is in need of this giant uh, infusion of philanthropic cash or that it's in the dire state that many philanthropists uh, state that it's in. So the sort of logic that undergirds it um, doesn't hold. Um, and so just, I mean, 
very quick conclusions, which we can then, you know, sort of share with everybody. Um, it seems like this organization is a small but mighty group, again, anywhere from 3 to 13 percent of overall talk. Uh, it appears to be increasing over time, so from 3 percent up to 16 percent. Um, and, and, and in a very last section of the paper, we kind of try to give some advice about this, and it seems to me that after talking to a lot of folks, some of this type of criticism is preventable, but then some of it is not. Great, and I see my time is up. Time that one perfectly. Thank you, sir. <laughs> On that note, I will uh, hand it off. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Larry? Yeah. All right, tell me what the button to push. I think the, the advancing arrow here. Yeah, that one. Uh, I think the other arrow. There we go. All right, I want to thank Rick and Jeff for inviting me. Uh, it's a topic I thought I knew something about and I discovered I did not, uh, which is for someone my age is very, I, can, I figure that that's kind of useful. Uh, notice there's no thoughtful up there. <laughs> and I wish I could blame Rick and Jeff for this because that was in the original chapter title of the proposed book uh, that was sent around. And for some reason, it slipped by me because it's not what I would ever put in a title uh, as if I'm more thoughtful than anyone else in the criticism. So it is not up there, and it won't be in the book, OK? Uh, here are three criticisms that I've looked at. It is not the bulk of the chapter that I've written. But I wanted to go over the uh, three main criticisms that I found in the literature, uh, mostly from media and academic articles. And uh, what I found, I reviewed the literature for each of them. And here's the conclusions uh, that I reached. And I reached that in the first few pages of the chapter. The critics have basically overstated the case for privatization and has slipped into hyperbole for any number of reasons. Uh, and I think it's quite understandable why people would, uh, would think that. But I, th I do think it's hyped up and inaccurate when you talk about the major decentralized system that we have of US education. For the other two criticisms, I do find that they're warranted as I read the literature and uh, in my own experience also. Uh, but these criticisms are not central to the chapter. What takes up most of the chapter is an unasked and critical question uh, about donor grants. Push forward now. Yes. All right. I'm going to have something to say about technology shortly. <laughs> I'm pushing this. Yeah, I think you want this one. Yeah, here, I can probably do this for you. How about you helping me out? Okay. <laughs> Remember this morning? <laughs> Jen, stop the clock. <laughs> Next one. That's it. Unasked critical question. There you go. Yeah, you're just going to want to hit that one when you go forward. Uh, hit the backward one. OK. Yeah. Now, um, I focus on this question uh, because I have found very sparse evidence of major changes in classroom practices and student outcomes. And I find that that undermines the current strategic uh, reform agenda of the major donors, which I do look at, which are Gates, Broad, and Walton. So I focus on this kind of a question. Now, why do I think that big donors have given and continue to give large sums of money to improve teaching and student achievement in the face of what I consider very paltry results? I'll wait a moment while you read it. I don't want to read it to you. Yeah. 
politically and practically short-sighted and myopic, this, the, uh, that the general uh, ignoring and underestimation of the policy to practice journey when it comes to implementation, an issue that Jay and others have brought up already, and <clears throat> what they ignore and are myopic about is basically the issues of building capacity and, uh, in school and implementation at the school site level. Teachers are indeed, this is the uh, amnesia or if it's not amnesia, it's uh, arrogance, or you can characterize it any way you want. But teachers are indeed policy makers, and that is often forgotten. They're policy makers in the sense that they put their thumbprints on every single policy aimed at teaching and learning. They decide what to put into practice of any innovation or new policy how much and to what extent. They are the gatekeepers, the role that both donors and policymakers historically have ignored. Are those the, uh, what does that say up there? Okay. Results of contemporary education? No. Back one. There it is. <clears throat> I want to give a few examples. The first one is the use of technology in classrooms. Since the 1980s, a huge investment has been made in uh, new technologies, hardware and software in public schools. I won't go over any of that. But underlying this major investment has been three promises that policymakers and donors made at the time and are still working. One is that student achievement will improve. The second is that traditional forms of teaching will change uh, in the right direction, which is often toward what is called student-centered, project-based, or whatever. The third is that uh, the investments in technology will multiply oppor job opportunities for students. <clears throat> when I've looked at the evidence, and I have repeatedly, I have not uh, found any support for those three promises, those three apparent goals of investing in technology. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, it raises uh, uh, serious questions about anything that would be what is called evidence-based decision-making, uh, data-driven decisions. It raises very serious questions about that. And if others know about such evidence, I am always eager to be taught and uh, that you would tell me about it. So that's the use of technology in classrooms as, uh, as the issue of implementation and how teachers are policy gatekeepers. The second is a, a brief example about the uh, Broad uh, Superintendent's Academy. Uh, Broad has uh, recruited, I think, a very useful and very exciting uh, portion of non-educators to become urban superintendents. As urban superintendents, Broad graduates uh, <coughs> aim to increase student achievement in their districts. That's what they were expected to do, and that's what they enrolled in an 18-month program to do that and to be supported after with it. Now, the idea was that they were to improve uh, achievement not in the one year or two years, but five to seven years, which is a reasonable amount of time for a superintendent to be in business and to try to, do, to reach that kind of goal. Yet when I looked at the number of graduates, about 200 graduates for a period of time, about almost a decade, they do not, Broad does not, to my knowledge, uh, list their graduates now and haven't for the past two years. Of those nearly 200 graduates, none have stayed seven years. Only two have stayed five years. Again, it's that policy to practice 
continuum, that journey, uh, a path filled with potholes and sinkholes that is often either ignored or thought to be someone else's business when you give a grant. Now why, ha oops, do the slide. Uh, now why have, oh, I don't want to read it to you. Uh, I think there are two reasons why policymakers and donors uh, have either ignored, underestimated, or whatever other reason there is. Uh, I think they live in different worlds. And the best way that I can uh, make that clear is to quote from a, uh, a colleague of mine, David Labory, a historian of, and sociologist of education. And he has this a long quote in, his rec in a recent book. Uh, teachers focus on what is particular in their classrooms. Reformers, donors and policymakers, focus on what is universal across many classrooms. Teachers operate in a setting dominated by personal relations. Reformers operate in a setting dominated by abstract political and social aims. Teachers embrace the ambiguity of classroom uh, pract uh, of classroom process and practice, reformers pursue the clarity of tables and graphs. Teachers put a premium on professional adaptability. Reformers put a premium on uniformity and, uh, in practices and outcomes. And the second reason that I think, and I uh, expand this in the chapter, is that policymakers and donors end up favoring changing structures over changing cultures in making school and classroom changes. Now the results of this contemporary uh, philanthropy in education, give the slide, Larry. All right. Does that say what I'm going to? Yes. OK. I don't trust it. <laughs> So please read that. Uh, because this is where I end up. I don't make any recommendations in my chapter. I give two educated guesses as to what's going to happen based on my research experience in the history of school reform and my uh, direct practical experience in public schools, K to 12. History of school reform reveals again and again that some changes stick, some leave traces, and some disappear. I point out in this chapter how the residue, and I believe there is a residue, and I name names about which reforms I think are going to leave traces and, uh, and stick around and which ones will not. I point out that that residue of donor-driven reforms will end up strengthening the status quo because the theory and assumptions donors operate under focuses narrowly on schools rather than the economic and social structures outside of schools. And that's it. So I hope you'll read the chapter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Howard? Um, yeah. Oops, yeah, first of all, I want to uh, thank Rick and folks for inviting me. I, I, I couldn't live with myself, though, if I didn't say something about the lack of the color in this room. And so one of the things it seems to me, if people are serious about all of this stuff, and, you know, I'm sitting next to a person who wrote a, a, you know, a book I use a lot, The Color of School Reform. And I, I just have to say to you all, if we keep having all of these meetings with all of the white folks in here talking about this, we'll also keep having the same results uh, over and over again. And I'm, I'm not criticizing anybody, you know, in particular, but I'm just trying to make sure that we don't keep doing these things and think it's okay, and then we don't say anything. So, um, you know, I want to say a couple things. I, I, I read both papers, and I, I really enjoyed them. It was difficult for me to read them, you know, as a person who's been called a tool of billionaires, uh, a shill of billionaires. Um, to read some of this stuff and understand how some of this criticism gets formulated, but trying to be objective and recognize, you know, what is reality and, and, and not make it personal. 
So I, I really learned a lot. And it's always difficult to read Larry's stuff because then you want to go back in your house. Uh, you know, it's like, why did I leave my house today? You know, uh, <laughs> you, know <laughs> you know, giving out little and <laughs> leaving my house means to anybody. You know, so, but, but you, know, you know, after having fought through that, you know, I decided to get on the plane anyway. Um, so l l l let me make a couple points. Number one, Larry, I, I would say on the, the, the sort of criticism of the broad superintendents, I would say look at how many, how many years anybody stays who's the superintendent. And so I think when we, look at, when we look at that data, we'd have to look at that. Because the one thing I learned as a superintendent is if you actually go in there to try to do something, it's, it's less likely that you're going to be there very long. Because ultimately, you keep making decisions every day. Am I here to actually help kids? And am I willing to really try to make significant change? And the moment you go down that road, your time is limited uh, as, a, as a superintendent. The second point I would want to make is um, when I was superintendent, I used to look over at um, the, the teachers union building was right across the street from central office. And I always used to characterize it as the dance of the dinosaurs. And, and so for me, the question of the role of these foundations is wh wh where would the support come from to fight the system? Because, it, because the, 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 the people who control the traditional system are not going to give you money to fight them. Uh, the teachers union, uh, they, they're aligned with the traditional system because they control it. And so for me, the struggle has always been, how, how do you get resources to fight for something that you believe in without uh, giving up your principles? And so, for example, as the chair of the board of a, a black organization that has gotten support uh, from Walton, we wouldn't exist without John Walton. And it's one of the many reasons why I, I love that man and, and will say it no matter what room we're in. The reality is without the support, we would not have been able to try to organize parents and others to fight back. And, 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 and so when people start talking about the, the, the limited billions of dollars that are, that are out there, and then of that limited billions of dollars, there's an even more limited amount that's available for advocacy. My question is, do, what about looking at how much is available to the other side to fight to maintain the traditional system? So at some point in time, you know, you struggle with that. And, and, and as the head of a black organization, I'm always re reminded of a quote that Martin Luther King made, which was that wh what happens is that there are black leaders who start out as uh, real messengers of the black community to the white community. And then the white community is very good at blowing smoke, basically. <laughs> There's a, they, he didn't say that. I'm just using that terminology, <laughs> but y'all get the point. Uh, and, and, and so all of a sudden what happens is you go from being a messenger from the black community to the white community to being a messenger from the white community to the black community. And so one of the struggles that you have when you take uh, funding is that we have to be assured that we are true messengers from the black community to the white community. And it puts us in a very difficult position because it is true that sometimes what funders want is they've got a list of things they support and they want you to take that list and convince black people that this is the best thing for them, even though some of what they're talking about is not the best thing for them. And so the, 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 the trying to get funding that recognizes uh, and accepts that some of what you all are talking about, with all due respect, doesn't work for our community. And that if we're going to represent our community, we got to be able to organize our community, not just mobilize them. Because more and more what I'm worried about is the f where I see this funding stuff going with the metrics and all of this, is that people are funding black, they, they love to see black and brown kids standing out there with signs. The issue is what, do, what, what, what change, what power is going to change by virtue of what, what it is we're doing. So, so for me, the issue isn't so much, I mean, we do want quality, and it, you know, there has to be quality at the end of this. But for me, the struggle is how do you gain power so that you can impact the decisions that are being made about your children? Whether they're being made by the funders 
or by the traditional system. And so some of us are in a very difficult place because we, we honestly believe that things like vouchers and charter schools and all, that, that what they do is they change the power relationships that, that, that existed. And, 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 and were it not for people who would fund us to fight, then what we would have to simply do is to accept the traditional system. And, and, and while it is interesting to hear the discussion about how much hasn't changed, let's talk about what existed before there was anybody fighting. It isn't as if all of a sudden we have a system that was doing excellent by our kids, and, and now we've got these interlopers who rolled up in here and said we ought to have something different, and somehow that's something different shouldn't be fought for. Now, the issue of how much is different, I think, is a valid question. But I would argue if there was no fight, you could be assured that there would be nothing different. And so many more kids would be worse off today than they are now were it not for some of these fights. And, and, and even though we, may not, we don't see like the critical mass, I would argue that one of the things that the KIPs and TFAs and others have done is that they have changed the idea that in America you cannot educate kids who are poor and who come from, quote, dysfunctional families. Because I actually agree with Larry that you, 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 you cannot fight to change schools and not take up a fight to change the things that impact kids before they ever get to a school. But by the same token, we have people who have historically used all of those things that happen to kids before they get to school as an excuse not to educate them. And, 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 and in turn, what they've done is to, is to place the onus for kids not being educated on their families and the conditions in their communities and not what it is that happens to them once they get to a school. And it seems to me that, 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 that unless you understand both of those and are willing to fight for both of those, we're not serious about helping kids. And what I would argue is that there are some funders who, who you, you, you know, like when people say no excuses, that cannot be the same as no empathy. Because the fact of the matter is it does matter if you slept in a car the night before. <laughs> And, 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 but at the same token, if you use the fact that kids slept in a, in a car the night before as a reason why they can't learn, that is also wrong. And so the, 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 for me, the question is how funders see that interplay between that reality mm -hmm. and the one that takes place uh, in schools. Um, I think the other thing that I would say is I always found it interesting that when I was a superintendent, if I got a grant from a corporation, very seldom was I called a privatizer. What I was called was someone who could raise money. But if, in fact, no, seriously, but if, in fact, as bail, I get a grant, all of a sudden, I'm a privatizer. And, and I've, I've, I've always been curious as to how the discussion takes place about whose money is OK and whose money is not. And for people on one side of the ledger, if they get money from X, that's OK. But if you get money from this one, that's not OK. And I've always thought in America that money is money. And, and, and the question is, if you get it, how do you use it? And, and so I'll, I know my minute is up, so I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Joanne? Um, hi. If I had known that uh, Jeff was going to mention that I've written lots of children's books, I would have prepared this in verse. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to do something very, very different from what Howard um, Fuller just did. My comments are super specific. Uh, maybe this is my deformation as a writer-editor. Um, so the McShane Hatfield uh, paper. I ended up liking this a lot which implies that there was a problem for me at the beginning. And I think that it just has to do with what Mike already talked about, the difficulty of getting a hold of what's negative and what's positive when you're looking at the media. And also, the situation, I think, is much more complicated now than it was 10 years ago because of the explosion of online uh, magazines and newspapers and other sites. But with the um, 
with the procedure of using LexisNexis and looking at all American news outlets, I just wonder what kind of weird things crept in there and if there was some way of con controlling for quality, which I know is subjective. But at a certain point, really bad things are obvious to everyone. Um, the other is, uh, using a series of extremely negative adjectives um, to then isolate what would be critical articles. I think that there are probably a lot of um, intelligent, worthy criticisms that don't use that kind of language at all. Um, I'm sort of happy to say that I only have used one out of those four or five words. Uh, Okay, now, so this is my suggestion for dealing with it, which is going to be very unpopular because it will take more work. But I think in addition to what has already been done, not a substitute, but in addition, I think that it would be worthwhile to go and look at, let's say, a half dozen of the most authoritative uh, media outlets, which one was still can you know use part of what Rick used ten years ago, like the New York Times and the Washington Post, but probably substituting you know like NPR and PBS for Newsweek, and to code those articles. I also think that because the amount of coverage of foundations is so much greater as Jen and Mike have pointed out in the paper, that you wouldn't have to look at 10 years. I think that you could look at 2014 and just see um, what the coding comes out as positive, negative, and neutral, and factual. Okay, then I think that um, there's a little bit of an effort on Jen and Mike to um, inflate how much criticism is out there. I mean, essentially, we've gone from 3.5% negative uh, in 2005 to 6.2% in 2013. That means that 93.8% of the coverage is either positive, neutral, or factual. Overall, I think when you look at the media coverage, I don't think that it's hugely critical. I agree that it's growing, but um, I think that using, that the number of negative articles about, is up 15% is really pushing it too much when in fact the coverage has already gone up 10%. Okay, now on to the section called um, ascertain political leanings of the critics. I think that this is easier to get a hold of and has worked out better. Um, now, Mike and Jen will have to correct me. I thought that at some point um, toward the end of that analysis, it was stated that 41 articles were used. Yeah. Okay. I think that's too small a sample. Um, okay. From the horse's, horse's mouth, which is that overview of what uh, the critics are saying all across the political spectrum. I thought that was terrific. I thought it was really accurate and covered the issues very well. I also thought that the what, who, why organization worked very well. And here I just want to point out something about wording. This was applied to all of the critics across the, um, across the political spectrum. Uh, the quote is that they are that they move readily and opportunistically to criticize the philanthropic organizations. I mean, they're critics, so they're going to be negative. But um, you'll have to explain to me why, how the critics are generally um, opportunistic. I didn't understand that. Okay, uh, one more small thing that needs adjustment is the statement about the political left often sees teacher evaluation as a misguided policy that threatens teachers' livelihoods. I think that if you look at the left criticism, the middle criticism, and perhaps some of the conservative criticism as well, if you ask about teacher evaluation, the first things that are going to be mentioned are the error rates of value-added uh, modeling, the quality of the standardized tests that are used, the fact that um, 
they're testing only some subjects and then there's a weird, bizarre thing that's happened. Some teachers are actually graded on the student, on some other teacher's student scores. So I would put that before um, the threatening of teacher's livelihood. And the sections, the final sections, making sense of it all and the conclusion I thought were really, really excellent. Okay, Larry Cuban. So as Larry said, he started out with these three criticisms and saying, let me just say this about Larry's paper in general. I think that it, the analysis is really rich and very wise. Um, so he mentioned that um, his first criticism seems to me, seems to him hyperbolic when critics say that the business leaders, the philanthropists, the civic leaders are aiming at privatizing the entire system. And this, you know, makes me want to be very careful how I phrase that. I think that that's a legitimate criticism, but I just want to point out this, that there is a model for education in the United States that is based around um, what you could loosely call complete privatization. It's, of course, the Milton Friedman model that is still supported by the Friedman Foundation. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Walton Foundation has given money to the Friedman Foundation. So it's an idea that's out there. And I want to say that, you know, given the assumptions of the people who support that, it's a rigorous idea, it's well thought out, it's logical. And for anyone who hasn't read the early 1950 the early 1950s article by Milton Friedman, which proposes this system-wide voucher system with public funding for the vouchers that um, you really should read it. So I just want to say to Larry that there is, I don't know, it might, it's a very small minority position, but there is a coherent position around privatization. Okay, next, Larry uh, brings up this question, why do philanthropists give in, continue giving in the face of such mediocre results? And um, I think he really digs into this wonderfully, but I think that he only answers that question at the very end. So, um, the section that he's described, which tracks the sinkholes and the twists and turns on the path from the policy discussion at the foundation to what actually happens in the classroom, that's, that's really terrific. And the donors do ignore all of those sinkholes. And by the way, it seems to me that that's going to become a major theme in the book, because I think it's been mentioned several times by you know, other people who have written other chapters. And um, then Larry does go back and offer this. But I think that that whole discussion doesn't answer why they continue funding. It answers why they're getting mediocre results. And then Larry's whole discussion about um, policy elites living in a different world from teachers. And so they ask different questions questions and they favor different solutions from teachers. I think that's all super excellent. But I think it answers the questions, why do philanthropists ask the questions they ask and why do they favor the solutions that they ask? It doesn't answer the question about why they keep doing this despite mediocre results. The mediocre results um, answer comes at the very, very end of the paper. And it's really just a phrase that I'm picking up on, which is um, myopia from an isolated world. I'm just going to label that the bubble. And um, I think that there, that's important, really, really important. And I think that it answers or no, it doesn't answer. It's getting at this question, which I agree with Larry, is it really important? Like why with these mediocre results is more and more done? Um, you know, as uh, Dana Goldstein has pointed out in her book, these things have been tried again and again. Uh, merit, pay, ranking teachers, 
and they've always failed in the past. The results aren't good now. Why, is, why are the foundations still pushing in that direction? So when Larry considers the bubble, I can't really find the right, the sweet spot here. Um, when Larry considers what I've called the bubble, I would just say this, that it could be expanded. There's the idea of philanthropists always being treated by as royalty, they never get the hard questions. But that has to be expanded now from just the grantees to this world of dependence that, I am almost finished, this world of dependence that um, the foundations now support, which has to do with all the advocacy groups, all of the project groups, and all of the think tanks that they give money. All of this thickens the bubble where they don't get any criticism. In addition to that, I'll just say two other things, and that also strengthen the bubble. One is the cult of money in this country. Obviously, there's always been a cult of money in the United States, but I think it's more extreme now, um, where people are just venerated and become cele cele uh, celebrities because they have earned so much money. And the final thing is we are in a period still of an ascendant market um, philosophy or the ascendance of the market. And I think that also thickens the bubble around the foundation people. I would like to even have more discussion and a better answer to this question, but that's as much as I have. Thank you. So we're going to open this right up to uh, questions, comments from the audience. Again, uh, as, as this mor earlier this morning, please tell us who you are um, and um, aim for concision. Hi, my name is Dave Price, retired teacher, still consulting. First, I'd like to thank AEI for their philanthropy, allowing me to have a Hires Root Beer today, which is very nice with my lunch. Uh, this is to Mike a little bit, or not a little bit, it is actually to Mike. In your study, you, your, your, in your remarks, you mentioned about social media and that type of thing now. And we really are, I'm also a former reporter, we, we really are in a new age uh, where a common man has access to the same press as everyone else in terms of that. So do you think that some of the criticism, it's easier now if I oppose you know, Bill Gates, I don't have to own a, a newspaper, I can start tweeting, I can start being on Facebook. Uh, did you look at that? And do you think that does have an impact, uh, sure. the effect of social media in all types of criticism, but specifically today in terms of how we view yeah, educational philanthropists? Yeah, absolutely. Almost all of the people that we uh, interviewed mentioned social media as uh, an ability to making their lives easier, the ability to share uh, with one another. Part of the reason we restricted our analysis, though, to LexisNexis searches was that we were trying to kind of get, it's tough to tell in sort of social media, like what sort of like bubbles exist, or if someone has 15,000 followers, it's like, well, like who, who are they? LexisNexis is kind of a way to see how does that trickle into the news outlets that the sort of average American reads on their um, breakfast nook table. So, um, uh, but yeah, all of them mentioned the role of social media, of Twitter, of Facebook, and all of those, and allowing them to organize with one another and disseminate their ideas much, much more easily. Hi, Cara Kerwin from the Center for Education Reform. This is a question for Larry. Um, when you talk about how the reform efforts have not been sort of driven by educators, I would argue to look at it a little bit differently because a lot of the charter operators and people who wanted to start new schools who thought by with giving you know, teachers and educators autonomy over their classrooms, autonomy over their schools, and then being able to choose sort of the model and the curriculum, that's where the charter school movement and the choice movement was born from educators. So I would argue to look at that a little bit differently and how educators have actually shaped the reforms that we have today. Did you want me to respond to that? <laughs> I disagree. Uh, charter, there are 6,000 charter schools. There are 100,000 public schools. It's still a drop in the bucket. It's certainly increased. And to some degree, part of that charter movement is uh, has been uh, motivated by teachers and parents. I accept that but an infinitesimally small fraction. 
This is basically, we're still in the midst over the past 30 years, from my point of view, in the midst of top-down reforms, of which donors, of course, it eases their life when uh, legitimate authority is centralized, either at the city and mayoral control, at the state, and now at the federal level. So now we're still in the midst with some kind of variation, of course, of top-down imposition of school reforms, and there is a hell of a lot of history behind what happens to those. Can I ask you a question? Do you see charter schools as an example of a top-down reform? I'm I just wondering what, what you... I see it as both. Both times, okay. Look at Race to the Top, and uh, uh, Stacy pointed out that you can buy a conversation. Or, no, it was Jay. Jay pointed out you can buy a conversation, you put money on the table, and you'll get states agreeing to anything. So all these states that say teacher evaluation, student test scores, and everything like that, they're all bought into it. But the pushback has only begun. In fact, I identify, identify in the chapter uh, the use of student test scores, the value added to evaluate teachers is a reform that will leave a bare trace, if at all. It'll be gone. Well, Larry, just to clarify Kara's question, too. So when you look at some of the most prominent charter school, uh, you know, some of the most prominent charter school brands, do you look at them, and to Kara's point, I think somebody looked and say, aha, these are teacher fuel, these are driven by educators, but it sounds like in your, when you look at them, you see something different. Can you just talk about that? Uh, yeah, I, I see that as part of the charter movement. Uh, you have uh, a teacher-run schools. There's a, a, a very tiny, may, uh, probably less than a score, uh, or maybe 50 in the entire country that are run by teachers. I accept that. And there are some charter management organizations that I, uh, I think are terrific, first rate, uh, from Aspire, Green Dot, and a few others. But nonetheless, uh, in the overall picture, uh, it represents still a drop in the bucket in terms of uh, regular public schools, the funding, and the current direction. I think charter schools I identify as one of the reforms that are going to stick. They're going to be around. They're not going to disappear from my point of view as I read it because now they've been bureaucratized and anything that is bureaucratized in American public education has a higher chance of sticking. So I don't know if that responds either to you or to your question uh, or your clarification, but that's the way I see it. Oh, this is a comment for Mike. And I say this with great pain as a journalist, but the average American is not looking at the new source, those new sources at their breakfast nook. Uh, that's a dated assumption. I mean, the average American is scrolling Facebook, actually, <laughs> to get their news. So that might not be a problem for your paper if what you're trying to do is summarize elite opinion and sort of the intellectual conversation on these things. But the average American's news source is television. So I'm wondering if there might be a way to get that into your analysis. And if not, maybe think about whether what you're looking at is a more elite opinion making as opposed to the media that the typical person consumes. No, and that's a fair point. I should say LexisNexis does also include a lot of, uh, I think, online news sources. So like the dot com, like CNN.com and all that sort of stuff. But but yeah, you're right. I, I don't know enough about sort of like Facebook analytics and those things to try and figure that type of stuff to do it in any sort of systematic way over time. And the same thing with like television. Co I, Jen spent a lot of time organizing this conference. We should have her, we could have her sit in front of a television and code uh, code news uh, uh, news time. But no, no, I think that that's a fair point. Unfortunately, it's it's kind of one of those situations where you have to kind of uh, search where the where the light is, not necessarily where your keys are. Yeah. Back, back over there. Hi, my name is Jane Meyerson. I'm from City Bridge Foundation. Um, Dr. Fuller, you mentioned that. We have to make it matter that students might be sleeping in a car the night before and basically those um, out of school challenges. So I'm wondering as a funder from your perspective to the fund funding group, what do you think we can be doing more to address those out of school challenges? Yeah, uh, two things. Uh, oh, sorry. I want to say two things. One, one is I, I just want to make the comment, and I, I think I heard Andy Smerick say this. Uh, 
But we need to start realizing that there's going to be a whole generation of kids who never knew that you couldn't have choice in, in education. And so one of the things is that all old people sitting around talking about change and this and that, we got to start understanding what does that mean to have created a situation where kids who are now two, three, four, five, six, seven years old are, are, are not going to know that there was a time when you could only have one place to go to school. And so I'm, I'm just trying to raise that in terms of what the ultimate impact of some of these changes are that seem small at this moment in history. What will they mean at a, you know, you know, at a later point in time? Okay, so the, to, to answer your question, see, I, 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 I'm, I'm hoping that funders are going to begin to understand that in order to help improve schools, we need to fund people who are fighting for issues like the minimum wage, who are fighting for uh, health care, who, who are fighting for things that impact the families of the kids that we're trying to serve, who, who would fight against things like voter ID, which is a way, in my opinion, to curtail the involvement of a significant number of these parents who could impact public policy over time. So, so, so if people are going to look at these things that impact kids before they ever get to schools, or put another way, if, if, if we believe that we've got to change schools, which I agree, we've also got to understand we've got to change the condition that the kids live under who come to the schools. And that unless we bring those two things together, some of the impact that we're trying to have, in my opinion, will be lessened over time. Can, can I just turn that into a question, and, and others can jump in on this. Uh, so one of the characteristics of the foundation world, it seems to me, has been a growing specialization, a more of a niche area of, of funding. And yet the kind of perspective you're offering here now suggests you know, the, the importance of, of tapping education questions into broader range of, 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 of questions. And I wonder if, uh, if that's another area of consideration, which is that uh, by pursuing more intentional impact in a narrow niche area, some of the foundation world may be missing uh, some of these uh, um, parallel areas, constituencies that they could be mobilizing and drawing on uh, that, by virtue of these criticisms, people are suggesting they ought to have been doing. Okay, I, a thought occurred to me, I'm sorry if it doesn't relate to what you said, it was prompted by what you said. Uh, there was a time when large foundations were very much involved with issues of poverty. And I think that that's what we don't see with these large foundations that have focused on um, public education reform. Obviously, there are lots of other foundations that do think about these issues. But the big four, I would include Arnold now, um, they seem to have decided that the two things that Howard has mentioned are quite separate and that you can solve the problem in the schools themselves. Yeah, I, uh, I would just to... Uh add to what uh, Joanne said is that it's both and, uh, but the nature uh, of the funders, these big ones, is that they were all successful in business and you got a problem, you roll up your sleeves and you solve it. And the problem is the schools. That's the problem. That's been defined as a problem, which then encourages more specialization from my point of view and makes it very hard for people who are uh, foundation officers to do the both and we're talking about where you can look for things that bridge both schools and the larger society. Now, as Joanne said, the old foundations, uh, some of their giving did do that bridging. I don't see that now. Could I, could I add one other point? Because yeah. I want to try to clarify what I'm trying to say is one of the things you all know that foundations get concerned about or people give you money is, quote, mission creep. And so the moment you start, like, getting outside of this 
framework that they've set up for you, they start hollering at you about mission creep, mission creep. Okay, so let me accept mission creep as, okay, I get that. What, 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 what I'm concerned about is many of us who are involved in ed reform do not get engaged in other work that goes on in communities that are trying to change the nature of, of what's happening to kids in the broader community. We tend to only be in coalitions that have to do with ed reform. Our opponents, on the other hand, are smart enough to know that if you're going to build constituencies over time, you have to be engaged in other things that are happening to people in their communities in order to build relationships and trust. But, it, but if your metric has you, uh, don't get involved in mission creep, you're going to tend to stay over there in, in that ed reform space, as all the young people say. And, 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 and as a result, we talk to each other consistently. Whereas our opponents are over there in the larger community space, building relationships, building constituencies. So when we roll out with our stuff, we get opposed because we're not engaged with the community in the largest set of issues that impact their lives. That's what I'm Could I ask oh, yeah. Howard a question? Yeah. Yeah, but then I want to get back to the okay. floor after that. Uh, um, could you just uh, describe a bit who the opponents are, your opponents? Yeah, well, it depends on what city you're in, but they all come. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's clear that, you, you know, with, you, you, even though Randy's, you, you know, smiles. And, I, I mean, I think the, the teachers union are clearly opponents of what I believe in. So are all of the other kinds of constituencies around traditional public education who believe that people like me are trying to privatize and, in essence, take away public space, which is actually the opposite of what I believe. But anyway, so I, I view those, the, you know, those people as opponents. But, but what also happens, and you notice, is that they're smart enough to create all kinds of front groups that have all these different names. But I was interested to see that nobody did tracing back to wh where does all of those people's money come from, because it gets traced back to uh, almost a single source or a couple single sources. So, so I, that, that would be my answer. I, I mean, it, it, but, but in a given fight, the, the opponents, you know, whether it's the ACLU, for example, sometimes it's the NAACP. I mean, it varies depending upon which aspect of the reform you're supporting. Hi, I'm Megan Tompkins Stang from the Uni University of Michigan. Hopefully, just a brief, pithy comment here. But Joanne, Joanne had talked about the bubble of isolation around foundations, and I think that ties in with something Stacy also said about bubbles <laughs> and the confidential informants. Um, speaking to the same dynamic about the reticence of foundations to be open to critique, um, to be interviewed, and I think that's a really important point that I wanted to underscore. As someone who did the interviews with these confidential informants, Gates was like getting into Fort Knox. You know, informants would not talk except under cover of darkness. And I'm someone who has close personal ties to people within these foundations, so I can't imagine what it would be like for the average citizen who might want to engage in that back and forth democratic debate that we talk normatively about valuing. So I think it just underscores an important point that the press critique public opinion is one of the few accountability mechanisms that foundations really have in terms of their engagement in a democratic debate. But they are very reticent to face that critique, uh, really worried about damage to their public reputation. And I think it's ultimately damaging for their democratic legitimacy and something that they should be more forthright about, not only being uh, facilitators of that debate, but becoming more accessible, publishing phone numbers and emails on the website, having a place where people can come to talk to a foundation representative, not being so isolated and secretive. Cuban said that uh, he thought foundations are, are making decisions without reference to evidence, and I imagine that you included within that um, historical experience um, yes. and not just um, uh, yes. current uh, empirical research. Um, and, but I think there are historical models of success that they could look to, although in your paper you describe historical failures and not successes. Um, and let me suggest a possible historical success, and since you're the actual historian, you, you might, I'd appreciate your comment on whether this is a model. So 
higher education was dominated in the 19th century by ministerial training schools, basically. Harvard, Yale, Princeton were not very good, especially at the sciences. And the industrialists of, of that age recognized this problem. They looked to the model of German scientific universities, and they didn't do any of the things that people are now trying to do to fix public schools. They didn't create a uh, Rockefeller Institute of training Ivy League presidents, right? They didn't do that. Um, they didn't give grants uh, to those institutions to engage in workshops for, for enhancing the sciences. Uh, instead, they built new universities. They built the University of Chicago, Stanford, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, Vanderbilt, um, a bunch of scientific German-based universities in the US. They competed against uh, those Ivy League institutions, which then pressured them to transform. So that is, I think, what Kara was saying charter schools are. Um, they are this new institution that's competing, that'll force change by competing, um, and you say they are going to endure because they're bureaucratized, which is just another way of saying that they have the political constituency to survive, right? So, yeah. so is that the model, that we need Choice is, uh, generates its own constituency and puts pressure on for change, while basically top-down testing, measuring, nudging teachers to teach in a certain way uh, uh, fails because it doesn't generate. It, 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 it falls in those potholes and sinkholes on the way. Is that, is that good history for, for foundations? Uh, I'm not going to comment on good history, OK? okay? Uh, but it sounds like you've uh, gotten into the voice of the advocate rather than the researcher in terms of the uh, support for charters being at that place that maybe foundations were when they did disrupt in the 19th century the higher education. There's no question that the uh, bringing over the, uh, the model of a scientific university from Germany uh, was a disruption to the existing American higher education. No question about it. I would argue that it was context dependent, and it did happen. Now, as for what you see as analogous in terms of the current charter movement and the question uh, that you asked, I don't see it that way because we're in the middle of it. Who the hell is going to know unless it's another decade or more, or even more than that? Look how long it took for the university model to be established where you get Slippery Rock Teachers College being called Slippery Rock University. That happened at least 60 to 80 years. You see the point that I'm making. We're in the middle of it now. You guys might be right. And you could stamp on my grave and said, I told you so, Larry. <laughs> no, but, but, but interesting enough, though, Larry just made an argument for why these funders ought to keep funding charter schools. I mean, because the way for us to know is to have another 50 years. After. No, I didn't make that oh, argument. Oh, you didn't make that argument? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I'm making the argument that the myopia of the funders, there is no pizzazz in capacity building. There is no pizzazz. There is no attraction in uh, funding ways to help uh, administrators and teachers implement policy. And that is, uh, that's the criticism right there, even with charter schools, because there's so much variation. You say charter schools, I think cyber charters. I think what's happened in Arizona and Ohio. There is great variation. It's not clear to me the direction it's going to happen. I happen to accept charters as a, as a favorable kind of choice mechanism. Not vouchers, but charters. So I think uh, we're in the middle of it, and it's too soon to but say. But Larry, when you, when you say traditional public schools, don't you think theme schools, specialty schools, math? See, what I'm saying is that variation exists within the traditional system. It, it right? does. Which people would argue as a positive, right, that, 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 that those variations exist. Why wouldn't we argue that it's a positive when we look at the charter world? Because uh, in the traditional world, that variation you just named is uh, shaped by uh, social class and inequalities. The, uh, there are a lot of people in this country that do not think that public schools are failures. Uh, and so the inequalities that exist in that larger 
school structure uh, and the larger society are also some of the inequalities that exist in the charter schools that they have to protect themselves against resegregation and so on like that. That's so, I, I, you know, one of the challenges, I think, for this debate in general and, uh, uh, and for this area of literature is how hard it is to keep a focus on the question of the role of philanthropy, which recognizes the, the breadth and, and variation within it, uh, and what their role ought to be in setting policies and how they proceed from, the, from some of these battles around the particular issues that some of the foundations are identified with. We just have a couple more um, uh, minutes, so I'm going to just use th those to put a question to the panel. I'm sorry for cutting off uh, from the audience. And, and just this one. A lot of the discussion so far in the, this earlier this morning and this one has talked about failure to connect with various constituencies, whether that's teachers as the gatekeepers or folks in the community who have a range of issues they're concerned about. Um, and uh, I, I wonder just whether what you think of the, the, the possibility that some of the anxiety now is really due to the fact that we're asking philanthropies to do something that they're just not particularly well suited for, particularly some of the newer foundations, which is grassroots advocacy work and mobilizing teachers. Uh, but in the contemporary world, no one knows where else to look because some other sources of, 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 of funding and others have, have contracted. I mean, is that part of it, is that the philanthropies, you know, are, um, are the game where these battles get fought out um, just because no one else is there? You know, actually, uh, I don't know. Um, from from my conversation with people, I thought, you know, uh, sp specifically speaking with some folks from the right end of the political spectrum around the Common Core, you know, a lot of that sort of pushback and organizing that took place. Um, I think was extremely low cost. I mean, many of those folks, it was actually via social media. Um, it was like a lot of um, moms and homeschool groups and others that sort of shared with listeners. So if social media is allowing that type of organization to take place, both either anti-particular forms or for particular reforms, that might decrease the need for, for philanthropic organizations to get as, as involved in that. But again, it's about the sort of issue at the core of it. Those, a lot of those conservative moms were extremely upset about the Common Core. They were networked with one another, and so they were able to all show up in a meeting or, or, or share that conversation with one another. Do you want to go before me? Pardon me? Will you go before me? No. <laughs> I asked. Uh, Just quick, okay, quick. Okay, quick. Um, standing in the way of lunch. <laughs> uh, what a burden. Too much, yeah. Um, I think that there's a fundamental problem of top-down with the foundations, which, and I don't mean all the foundations. Once again, I'm talking about these big ones and especially the big four. And I think that's going to make developing constituencies and political support for, for what they do extremely difficult. And then the role that these big foundations play in offering money and the eagerness to say whatever they want in order to get the money is related to the um, underfunding of the public sector in general in the United States, that we have these huge high expect uh, expectations for what we want the public schools to do, and we just don't have enough funding to make that possible. So then you look at these foundations. Larry? Howard, any I, have, final I have nothing to offer. I don't need it. Perfect. So we're exactly on time. Lunch is how? Lunch is uh, the which foyer. Always good. Uh, always see you. We'll good good see. the last session at 1240. Thank you. All righty. Uh, hey, we are uh, about to embark on the, uh, the final panel of the day. Um, if, we're, uh, if it's anywhere near as uh, interesting as the first two, I think... Uh, we're going to finish real strong. Uh, this is really a panel that's uh, got a little bit of a forward-looking bent of what's next uh, for philanthropy and for the new philanthropy. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, three really uh, interesting papers, uh, and then well, another discussant who you know, knows more about this stuff uh, than uh, just about anybody else going uh, and is in a position to talk about it. 
Uh, first paper is by Dana Goldstein. Uh, Dana's paper is titled The Gates Foundation's uh, MET Project that measures effective teaching. Uh, paying attention to pedagogy while privileging test scores. Uh, Dana is a staff writer at the Marshall Project. Uh, previously, she was a Schwartz Fellow at the New America Foundation uh, and a Puffin Fellow at the Nation Institute. Uh, she's a former associate editor of the Daily Base, uh, and she uh, last year was the author of the terrific Turn book. Oh, thank you. Author of the terrific book, The Teacher Wars, A History of America's Most Embattled Profession. Uh, next up is my colleague, Andrew Kelly. His paper is Philanthropy Goes to College, uh, co-authored with Kevin James, who's also a colleague of ours here at AEI. Uh, Andrew is our director of the Center on Higher Education Reform and a resident scholar at AEI. Uh, Andrew's research tends to focus on higher ed issues, but he's also written widely on K-12. His books include Stretching the Higher Education Dollar, Getting to Graduation, and carrot sticks in the bully pulpit. Uh, a few years back, he was named one of 16 next generation leaders in education policy um, by Education Week. Now he's one of, he's one of the dozens of uh, middle-aged scholars <laughs> dabbling in these issues. Uh, third, we've got Alexander Russo. Uh, Alexander's paper is titled Inside Foundations, Eight Lessons from Funders and Grantees on Education Giving. Um, and Alexander Russo is a freelance writer, blogger, and author. His work has appeared in a variety of popular publications, including Slate, The Atlantic, and USA Today. Uh, his website, uh, with which many of you are familiar, This Week in Education, is one of the nation's longest-running ed policy blogs. And uh, Alexander is author of the book Stray Dogs, uh, Saints and Saviors, Fighting for the Soul of America's Toughest High School, about the turnaround effort out in L.A. Uh, that Steve Barr undertook a few years back. Um, and our discussant on this panel is Jim Blue. Uh, Jim is the president of Students First, uh, where he took uh, the reins from Michelle Ree. Uh, the focus at Students First is on policy opportunities in a dozen different states. Uh, previously, Jim was a K-12 reform director at the Walton Family Foundation, where he guided more than a billion dollars in investments uh, towards uh, activist educators uh, and school reform. Uh, Jim has also worked at the Alliance for School Choice and its predecessor, the American Education Reform Council. Uh, with that, Dana, would you be kind enough to get us started? Sure, so I'm the underachiever of the day and I don't have slides, so <laughs> I'm going to speak. Um, I'm not gonna describe the MET Project to you here today because I think most of us here are probably pretty familiar with it. And as I go through some of the critiques of the project, I think you'll learn a little more about it, hopefully. Um, so instead, I'll start with a discussion of research budgets and what chunk of philanthropy that represent to the best of my knowledge, which is somewhat difficult because even within the foundations themselves, there's different ways of defining what research is. It could be research plus advocacy and um, entail ed trust or other groups that sort of take research findings and promote them. So it's a little bit complicated, but as far as I can tell, from the conversations I had with my sources for this piece, Gates is giving about 6% annually in the last several years to research. And that includes evaluation and dissemination of research findings. And that um, accounts for 6% of its budget and it's $25 million annually. Um, to compare that to Walton, $1.1 million annually for research. And I, I want to just throw the Spencer Foundation in here as a comparison point. Their entire budget is $15.3 million. And as we know, Spencer is largely focused on research. So Gates, $25 million annually, Walton, $1.1, and Spencer, $15.3. Um, I think the MET project, the Measures of Effective Teaching project from the Gates Foundation, attempted to address what is probably the strongest critique of the Gates-Obama school reform agenda, and I'm just gonna use that as a shorthand, um, alighting some complexity there, as we journalists love to do. Um, <laughs> um, that the agenda focused on human resources, on structural questions, and didn't focus enough on the actual uh, nuts and bolts of instruction in the classroom. And I think that Larry made an excellent articulation of this critique. And clearly the MET project was an attempt to kind of make up for that potential shortcoming in that it videotaped 8,000 lessons and it really looked at what the teachers were actually doing and then it wanted to see if those, um, if those instructional techniques as assessed using five different classroom observation methods were correlated with value added gains. 
While research on teaching by philanthropists is not new, this close look at instruction was new. Um, as I discuss in the paper, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching has done a lot of mixed research and advocacy over the past century. Um, and it focused traditionally on the pipeline of teachers. So in 1920, they came out in favor of a more vocational model uh, for educating teachers with the real focus during the undergraduate years on pedagogy. And then they reversed that stance in 1986. They were an early sort of advocate of the master's degree in teaching, followed by a bachelor's degree in subject. Um, another thing that makes MET different, in addition to the fact that it's focused on instruction, is that it came out the same time that Race to the Top incentives were changing, actually changing teacher evaluation across the country. Um, so this was a study of a policy that was not necessarily intended to change policymakers' opinions. They had already successfully changed those opinions. The, the reform community had already successfully changed the opinions. The law had changed. And now we're going to go test it. That was sort of what the theory was, at least. So what are the critiques of the MET project? I'm going to go through a number of them and say a little bit about whether I found that they were more or less compelling. Um, the first is that Gates can't be trusted um, because the Gates Foundation, since 2007, has had a clear um, position in the debate about teacher evaluation. They clearly believe teacher evaluation should be tied to student learning gains as measured by standardized tests. They've been funding all sorts of organizations in DC that we heard about earlier who support that, and therefore why would we trust their scholarly research funded by them on this question? Um, now, I interviewed a number of scholars from all across the ideological spectrum for this article, and they disputed that argument very strongly. Um, Thomas Kane's methodology was very strong for this. They said that if Jesse Rothstein had done the same study, he would have come up with the same data, but he would have interpreted it differently, which is going to get me to the next several critiques. But I think off the bat, I just want to say that it, it is considered good, strong scholarly research. Um, a second critique, it's the question of stakes. Now, in the districts that were used, that were part of the MET project, the stakes for evaluation were low. So administrators were not using the value-added scores that were being collected to actually fire teachers or um, have to pay them differently, or the other sorts of policies that we know states are now pursuing as a result to raise the top. So therefore, potentially, the MET project was not actually testing the, the, the policies that have been implemented. A third critique, uh, Gates was not, the Gates Foundation has been critiqued for not being forthcoming on the limitations of the methodology. So in other words, it's not surprising that Met found that value added scores are the best predictor of value added scores in the future. As described to me by several scholars who I interviewed for this paper, any measure is its own best predictor of that measure in the future. So the best predictor of today's weather is yesterday's weather. That's the example that I got. Um, so is it, so th therefore, it's not surprising that last year's value-added scores for teacher A were more predictive of this year's value-added scores than last year's classroom observation scores. So hopefully you're following along with that. Um, critique four. Certain findings were not publicized as heavily as others. I found this one quite compelling. Um, so I think we're all aware that the Met project found that student surveys were a, were a pretty good measure of whether teachers produced value-added learning gains. But here are some of the other less well-known findings from Met. Um, that when teachers are surveyed on their working conditions, their relationship with their principals, with parents, with communities, what it's like to be in the school day to day, teachers' answers on those surveys were predictive of student learning gains. Um, they found that grit. They were or were not? They were. And that was not. That didn't really, that wasn't quite clear from the 2013 document dump, but since then, a, a, like a 500 page book has been published by the foundation, and there's a whole chapter that looks at this. Um, they looked at grit measures, on the, they added that into the student surveys, and the grit measures didn't seem to have a strong relationship to student achievement gain. So we hear a lot about grit. The MET project seemed to, to question that a little bit. Um, as a group, the 8,000 lessons that were videotaped, they rated highest on student discipline and lowest on intellectual depth. Interesting. Um, only 14 to 37 percent of the differences between teachers on classroom observation were due to differences in their practice. 
14 to 37 percent of the differences on classroom observation were due to differences in teachers' practice. The rest of the difference was due to the difference between the raters, the variation in teacher skill day to day, like any of us might be more on today than we are on tomorrow, um, and student demographics. And teachers of poorer students seem to be systematically discriminated against in classroom observations. And this calls into question the whole you know, idea animating this reform push around teacher evaluation, which is that it, we can do fair classroom observations. Um, compliance on random assignment of students to teachers, which is crucial for this type of research, was, was low. It was not great. Um, the highest city was Dallas with 66% compliance on the random assignment. But three of the cities, including New York, Denver, and Memphis, were beneath 50%. So when students were randomly assigned to teachers participating in the experiment, more than half of them in those cities somehow ended up in another teacher's classroom. Um, the fifth critique, and the last one I'll mention today, is whether just this, um, this convergence between the federal reform agenda and the venture philanthropy agenda has led to a narrowing of the type of research that policymakers and practitioners are aware of. And this, to me, I think was the most interesting thing I found researching this paper. Um, as I have been aware of as an education journalist and an author, there's lots of fascinating research coming not just from labor economics, which is where value added comes from, but from sociology, from cognitive psychology, from political science. Um, scholars in those fields are looking at questions about classroom discipline school funding equity, relationships between teachers and principals and how that impacts student achievement. Um, these questions might be equally important, even if our goal is just to raise student test scores. These questions of, of, of funding, of classroom discipline. Um, and yet, policymakers and practitioners, superintendents, principals, are not are not reporting that they're aware of that research as much as they are of the research that is very heavily promoted by the venture philanthropies. Thank you, Dana. Uh, Andrew, uh, talking about how some of this applies when we start thinking about investments in higher education. Sure. Thank you, uh, Rick. Thanks, Jeff, for um, inviting me to do this. Um, the K-12 um, system tends to be the problem child in America, and the higher ed system is it's older and more mature straight A student, um, or so so we've been uh, told to believe uh, over the years. Um, <clears throat> the, the argument we make in our paper is that this has um, changed dramatically over the last couple of years. So traditionally, uh, American higher ed, and I'll just preview the argument here so I get to it so I don't uh, spend all my time on the, on the, on the front end. Um, traditionally, higher ed seen as the best in the world, right? Um, and Jay even, I think, alluded to this earlier, that one of, the, one of the successes that he cites for private philanthropy was the creation of more of the best in the world universities. Um, what's your philosophy as a uh, foundation or a, or a government, for that matter? If you believe that your set of existing institutions is the best in the world, you want to subsidize more of it. You want to subsidize more of what they already do, right? Um, so to borrow from Jay, um, that leads to what we would describe as uh, some low leverage giving, right? You, you spend money on scholarships and capital projects and general support to expand what colleges already do. You also spend on research, uh, to be sure. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about that in a second. Um, but, but more recently, there's rising dissatisfaction with the cost of college and, and, and student outcomes at colleges. Um, and I, th I think it's hard to ignore this. Um, so what, you know, what is your strategy if you're dissatisfied with the existing system and the existing institutions? Well, you, you use your resources to advocate uh, for reforms that change the flow of public money. So again, to borrow from Jay's chapter from 2005. Um, uh, more high leverage, uh, more high leverage giving, um, according to his definition. Um, so, and not surprisingly, the punchline is that different perceptions of the system um, lead to very different strategies in giving. Um, and our and our goal in the paper was simply to describe those different strategies um, using some data. Uh, from the Foundation Center. Um, so just to quickly back up, I thought I'd just give you some illustrative um, uh, quotations of, of where we've been and where we're at. Uh, this is the Ford Foundation president in, 19, in the early 1950s, which back then, I guess, if you were a foundation head, you made the cover of Time magazine, which is pretty, pretty impressive. 
Um, these days, if you're on the cover of Time magazine, it's usually um, uh, you know critiquing critiquing your philanthropic gifts, but or carrying a broom, right? Or carrying a broom and dressed all in black. <laughs> Correct. Um, so uh, you know, just quickly, right? The place of the state university in this complex system is it, pattern is secure. Um, its influence is 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 likely to only grow over time, right? So let's fast forward now to, uh, to today, and um, uh, Lumina Foundation, um, which is one of the two that we focus on in the paper, uh, the, fa the fact is the future of American higher education uh, system hangs in the balance. The system that once served us so well uh, is in need of redesign. That's Jamie Marisotis, the president of Lumina. Um, Gates Foundation has struck a similar tone, right? If college is the engine of our nation's economic development, then we need a lot more fuel in the tank. And that doesn't just mean more money, um, uh, as far as uh, Gates is concerned. This, this change in perception parallels and has, in fact, influenced um, changes in the way elites have discussed uh, uh, higher education in, in, in this country as well. President Obama, um, before him, um, Secretary Spellings uh, under George W. Bush, have expressed uh, deep dissatisfaction with the, st the stat uh, status of our higher ed system. Um, what's interesting, one of the points we make in the paper, is that higher ed hasn't really had its nation at risk moment, right? And so, so part of what foundations have funded, G Gates and Lumen in particular, is making the case that higher ed is in need of reform, which which in K-12, it's sort of been an assumption, I think, since 1983, right? Um, or, or before that, even. Um, and nowadays, uh, but, but, but higher ed, you sort of had to make that, make that case. So quickly, um, I, this leads to, to expectations about how you would spend your money, right? The different, the different perceptions. Um, I've already gone over some of those. So the old school, you'd fund projects that, that build access um, at, is, at, at existing institutions. The primary categories you'd fund, probably university-based research, uh, scholarships, capital projects, general support. Basically making campus, existing campuses bigger and helping more students reach them. Um, if you're part of the new school, you're going to fund organizations outside of, ac uh, outside of the academy to make the case for reform and build coalitions, and also to invest, uh, I should say also to invest in direct services to help uh, boost student completion um, and readiness for, for college. So uh, what did we do? We looked at some data from the foundation directory. These data are really difficult to work with. Um, I think that's probably been made abundantly clear already. Um, what's really tough on the higher ed side is they, category, they categorize any grant that's gone to a higher, uh, an institution of higher education as, as a higher education grant. But but the vast majority of that money goes to scientific research. Um, and so it's hard, really hard um, to say, to, to, to even come up with the top funders of higher ed philanthropy in the, in the, in the sense that we're discussing it in the K-12 context. We coded each grant uh, according to the recipient type and the grant purpose. We had to exclude university-based research on topics outside of higher education because, um, because it, it sort of was not, not a very accurate picture. Um, so Robert Wojohn the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, one of the biggest foundations giving to higher education, vast majority of their grants go to scientific research, public health and health and healthcare. Um, they still made our cut um, of the top foundations, but what we did was we actually downloaded grant specific data for each of these 15 foundations. The paper gets into how we came up with the list. Um, we're also not, I should say, we're not the first um, to write about this sort of shift to strategic philanthropy. There's a great paper, uh, 2012 AERA paper by um, Cassie Hall and Scott Thomas, two sociologists that looked at this. Um, we, we started with their list of 14 most active in the, in the two, first decade of the 2000s, and then we added some that came up um, more recently. So uh, this gives you a sense of the, of the grant making in 2012. Gates and Lumina rank near the top in both number of grants made and in terms of uh, the money spent. Um, so where did the money go? Uh, well, the first thing to notice here is 66% of the grants at the other 13 foundations that we looked at went to institutions of higher ed, barely half, uh, just under half at the Gates Foundation, and, and less than a quarter at Lumina uh, actually went to institutions of higher ed. Um, what's another thing to notice here? Um, funding of research, uh, of nonprofit research organizations. So I think Dana sort of discussed this earlier. Think places like AEI, places like the Education Trust, places like uh, New America Foundation. Um, uh, uh, the other foundations, the 13 others, gave about 5%. Um, uh, Gates and Lumina gave between um, 12 and I think it's, uh, yeah, 13 and, uh, and 22%. Um, so already you see some big differences here. The other is um, giving to government and quasi-government agencies. Um, and so this is this was a sort of loose category. Um, some of these are uh, boards of regents, it's states that oversee the higher ed system. Some of these are uh, interstate networks that that where states have signed on to, like the Western Interstate Compact for Higher Education or the SCR, SREB. Um, 
Gates and Lumen are giving lots of money. Um, uh, sorry, not lots. They're giving a much larger proportion of their money uh, to these kinds of institutions than um, than than the other thirteen. Um, where does the money go if you're giving to college? If you're giving to colleges, well, we thought maybe there'd be a big difference between whether you give to elite colleges or you give to colleges where the students actually are, um, uh, depending on your view of the system. So if you think the system is best in the world, you're likely to give a lot to elite colleges, and that's exactly what we found. Um, uh, just under a third of the grants at other foundations. Uh, went to um, institutions in the top 50 of the U.S. News and World Report, uh, much lower proportion at Gates and Lumina. Um, and then community colleges, very little money from the other 13 foundations went to community colleges. Gates and Lumina, um, whoops, Gates and Lumina, a ton of it actually did. Um, almost a quarter at Lumina um, went to community colleges. Um, uh, also, you give to D.C.-based organizations, right, if you're trying to influence policy. Um, you give to D Lumina gave about 40% of its grants in 2012 to D.C.-based organizations. Um, grant purposes, I'm going to zip through this pretty quickly. Um, this is overall, and if you look at this, 50, about 50% goes to capital projects, general support, and scholarships. This is with all the foundations included. Once you disaggregate, though, you see that those categories, uh, they're still pretty prominent among the other 13. They're almost non-existent at Gates and Lumina. They do not give for capital projects. They do not give for general support at universities. Um, and uh, again, um, this is, uh, and I'm having a hard time reading the slide, so uh, I apologize. Um, that is, uh, that's looking again at, um, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, showing how much money goes to research to nonprofit um, uh, research or research on higher ed. Um, uh, this is just their priorities. I'm going to skip through this and get to the, some of the um, discussion um, at the end here. Which is what are the uh, what's been the pushback on this? Just to be uh, even handed about this, I don't think this story is all uh, a positive one. Um, there's been quite a lot of pushback. One one bit of feedback, one bit of pushback is of course. The standard argument we've heard uh, for throughout the day, which is the consequences for democratic accountability, I'm not going to go over that. Um, there's also been a sense that they've excluded higher ed practitioners from this whole process; that they're not, they haven't included their voices. Um, uh, unintended consequences of the completion agenda, focusing on student success, um, that will cheapen the power of, uh, uh, you know, cheapen, cheapen the value of a college degree if we start giving them out, if we start to set the incentives. Um, uh, such that there's an incentive to increase um, productivity. Um, and then preferred solutions may outstrip research, which I think Dana got into, so I don't have to discuss that. Quickly, um, I will just say good or bad for education. I think um, shifting focus from, uh, from elite colleges, from the top 100 elite colleges and toward the places where students actually are, and the fact that there are problems in that system is incredibly valuable. I think that's been, that, that it, it's, it's hard to argue um, against that. Also, focusing more on people who are uh, older students, non-traditional, not between the ages of 18 and 24 is great. Um, uh, creation of counterpoint to higher education, the higher education lobby, I think, is important. There's this is sort of this is sort of gone unsaid today, but there's there's a lot of um, uh, seems to be a lot of consternation about um, uh, you know the consequences of democratic accountability. It, what's interesting is I don't hear as much about the trade associations that basically control um, policy making in D.C. Often uh, uh, the same amount of consternation about that. And then just quickly, I wanted to say one thing quickly that's related to that, which is there's this, there's a sense that there's a quid pro quo uh, when you read some of the criticism that that foundations are paying people to change their opinions about this. That is just nonsense um, from where I sit. The, the money is desi designed to amplify people's voices that already agree with them. Um, and if you, and you, can, you can critique that as much as you want, but there's not a quid pro quo here. Um, and, uh, and I'll leave it at that. So I'm already over time. Sorry. Great. Uh, Andrew, and uh, Alexander, uh, Jeff and I imposed upon you to try to talk to folks uh, in and who have been in the foundations and try to draw some of the lessons uh, that folks have learned in the last 10, 15 years of doing this work. Um, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Great. Um, thank you uh, so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And for those of you who are um, uh, 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 just flipping through the paper right now, this is the perhaps the most qualitative of the uh, papers uh, that I've come that that um, you're going to hear discussed. Um, I was essentially asked to and took great pleasure in finding uh, current and former program officers, traditional. Uh, new style and, and venture, uh, which is a slightly different thing than the, uh, the, what we call the new philanthropy, um, talk to them and ask them a little bit about what they thought the new philanthropy was and what aspects of it they thought worked or didn't work. Um, and then uh, on the slides, you'll see some of what I thought were some of the most uh, 
uh, thought-provoking or unexpected or compelling quotes from the piece, which includes quotes from people all the way from Fred Freelo at Ford, um, all the way up to Jim Blue, um, uh, uh, or Chris Nelson at the Fisher Family Foundation. Um, it was uh, uh, difficult and interesting to get people to talk to me. Um, I came to, I come to the topic of philanthropy and education having looked at it through a couple of lenses, first and foremost by uh, tracking the news coverage of uh, education philanthropy every day on my blog. Um, and uh, watching the, the hype, uh, the hype uh, skepticism, disappointment cycle um, that's been happening over the years. It would be fascinating, uh, again, qualitatively to uh, uh, look at the headlines about uh, 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 the Gates Small Schools Initiative at the beginning. Um, uh, really different headlines, really different stories written uh, than the type of stories you get now. So I've been, looked at this as a, as a watcher of education media. Um, and then also over the years, uh, partly due to, um, uh, with Rick's support um, at AEI, I've been commissioned to do a series of case studies where I've looked at foundations and foundation-funded efforts. Um, and if you're at all interested, um, I did uh, one on the evolution of Teach for America, um, uh, uh, which was originally very narrowly uh, interested in, in, uh, in uh, programs and services, and then came to have a very uh, strong policy and advocacy operation on the Hill. Um, uh, SEAL Team 6 uh, uh, operation, able to pull tricks uh, uh, on the Hill that I, as a former Hill staffer, had never seen uh, pulled before. Um, I also um, uh, did a look back at Waiting for Superman, which was a foundation-supported effort at mass media, um, uh, changing hearts and minds at the mass level. Um, and uh, I also looked at Ed No. 8 which is uh, Gates and Broad trying to make education a top issue in the 2008 uh, pre presidential campaign. Um, so there's lots of interesting uh, stuff that's been going on, and I've really appreciated the opportunity to, uh, to look at it. Um, uh, I talked to traditional, I talked to a variety of funders and grant recipients, and I boiled down, uh, at the insistence of Jen and Rick, I boiled it down into eight lessons. Note the uh, air quotes, lessons. Um, the funders, uh, uh, the, the program officers and grant recipients didn't always agree, oftentimes did not agree about um, what had worked and what hadn't worked. Um, there were some areas of overlap in terms of areas of interest, and then there were some, uh, some occasional agreements, and those we've turned into lessons. But um, if you are in the room and were quoted uh, in the piece uh, or uh, read the piece later, anyone who reads the piece later on, not everyone's going to agree with everything I said. It, it's gone through the Alexander filter as well. So um, let's take a look at um, what folks said. Um, and the first, uh, I, the question I asked was, uh, uh, what have you done that's differently and has it worked? Um, and the answer writ large was that, that there were some interesting improvements in both what was being funded and uh, 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 its effect, its eff uh, and how it was being given out. The, the strategy of giving out money has changed in the last five or 10 years. Um, and then, then the differences began. Lesson number one, policy and advocacy are great tools to a point. Pretty much all of these lessons had to do with um, uh, the issue of taking something and then perhaps that was good and then taking it a little bit too far. Uh, we've heard a lot here and before here about um, uh, the growth of policy and advocacy and um, this was one of the most interesting uh, uh, responses I got on the issue of policy and advocacy, which is um, if your uh, policy uh, and advocacy efforts get out ahead of you, um, you can end up locking in uh, something before you're ready to have it uh, locked. Uh, you're ready to have it locked in. I hadn't thought about that. I'd thought about mostly about policy and advocacy as a as a way to defend the space or or sort of protect. Uh, what you were trying to do on the programmatic and services uh, level, and that was a big difference. Uh, lesson number two, um, the new approaches, policy and advocacy, complicate things quite, quite a bit. Uh, Bob Schwartz is a longtime funder, now, at the, now a long time at the Harvard uh, uh, Ed School, um, and he pointed out that, um, that this issue of metrics is difficult in the policy and advocacy world. There's some papers written by Steve Tellis, T-E-L-E-S, that I would recommend. It's very, very difficult to measure advocacy. Um, and um, 
uh, all sorts of new challenges come out both from the grant recipient end and the grant making end. Lesson number three. Um, these uh, new organizations that have gotten funded, uh, pop-up shops, someone called them, um, they uh, will do exactly what um, they will do exactly what you uh, want them to do, um, but they don't necessarily have the the gravitas or the credibility or the longevity that some of the established nonprofits might have. And indeed, we've seen some of the nonprofits that are new um, have folded. Um, uh, Yoli Flores um, had a teacher voice. Uh, a Gates-funded teacher voice effort that folded. Um, it's, it's hard to uh, create one of these things uh, out of thin air and have it last. Lesson number four, strategic philanthropy is uh, uh, powerful but can be too rigid. rigid. I heard people describe both strategic and impact philanthropy were the terms that I use the most um, to describe the new philanthropy. And then a subset is this venture philanthropy, which is something quite different. I don't have time to get into the details, but I would urge all of you who are watching this to understand that even within new philanthropy, there are at least two major strands. And the venture people and the strategic people sometimes think uh, that the other people are idiots. <laughs> metrics, oh my gosh, I heard a lot about metrics, about the importance of metrics, and then about the incredible burden that some of these metrics these uh, requirements for deliverables and outcomes uh, placed. And um, again, uh, not very few people said that metrics were a bad idea. We don't want to just give someone cash and say, we'll see you in a while. But um, a uh, I got the sense that, that uh, they had been adopted perhaps by j very junior program officers. Hey, one metric's good, two metrics is good, hey, 10 is even better. So there were some complaints about metrics, including from um, the very articulate um, Michelle Rhee. Um, she might have been complaining about your metrics, Jim. Um, <laughs> lesson six, uh, failing fast is a big idea out in Silicon Valley. If you're going to fail, fail quickly, improve, improve, improve. Um, it isn't something you necessarily see a lot of in education philanthropy. Um, sometimes, however, as has been discussed here before, um, uh, there's an overreaction. Uh, there's either an, uh, an avoiding or ignoring, a, a quiet, uh, uh, a quiet uh, ending of a grant, or there's, um, as in the case of small schools, perhaps a premature or an overreaction. This idea of failing fast and a, a fail, failure-based culture in the positive sense is something uh, um, that people had lots of thoughts about, and there's more in the paper about that. Lesson seven, um, the grind. Um, implementation, capacity building, uh, leadership development. There's a whole set of things that seem to have been de-emphasized in the new philanthropy um, were hallmarks of the traditional philanthropy, um, not nearly as sexy. Again, I heard a lot from grant recipients, including grant recipients who were very much of the reform movement, saying, hey, policy changes are great, advocacy is great, um, uh, scaling up is a wonderful thing. We've got to have the people and the places and the things. We have to be able to uh, uh, do this over the long haul. That was a big uh, lesson. Jim Ferris is from uh, USC. Lesson eight, coordination. A little more coordination, but not too much. Um, the idea, uh, the, the, the idea, uh, we all have this idea that the foundations are um, all, all on Slack or G-chatting together all day. Um, hey, I'm going to give to these guys, you're going to give to those guys. Um, the perception from inside the, uh, the people who talked to me on the funding and the re grant recipient end of things was actually that there was frighteningly, uh, there was more coordination than there may have been in the past, but still um, not nearly as much um, as was imagined and as would be um, effective. And in fact, um, uh, even if you look at just Gates, Broad, and, uh, and Walton, um, these, these three foundations have distinct distinct approaches, methods, priorities, funding cycles. Um, and uh, it's important to understand um, that there are some important differences between all of these. What's next? Um, I asked everyone to say what's happening next in the next five or 10 years. A return to race and inequality as a grant, uh, as a grant activity, um, more parent engagement and community organizing, uh, advocacy bigger and smarter, would be scary or um, uh, 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 the idea of... Well, is anybody predicting dumber advocacy? 
<laughs> uh, weaker. Uh, the worry was that the advocacy had been uh, weak and uh, naive, um, that, uh, that you have a victory and then a rollback in regs, or you have a policy change and then a gut in practice. Um, Hybrid grant making, Jeannie Oakes from Ford uh, uh, talked to me a long time about, for a long time about mixing the best of the new and the old. And she argued that Ford had done some traditional and uh, new foundation uh, approaches. And then um, diversity and diversification came up a number of times. Okay. Thank you, Alexander. Jim, you've been in this world a long time. You've thought deeply about this. Curious of your thoughts and your reactions to the papers. And we'll try and keep it pithy. Um, so first of all, I, I'd love to quote um, Larry Cuban, who began by saying, I thought I knew a lot about <laughs> philanthropy, but after reading those papers, I learned I did not. Um, I was uh, very much taken by um, the very different perspectives of what I do for a, had done for a living. I should probably pause and acknowledge that about uh, six weeks ago, I left the Walton family. Um, to uh, run probably the only organization more despised uh, in America, <laughs> um, at least among policy elites, and that is Students First. And, and I, I have to admit that as, as I talk about this, that experience over the last several weeks has colored uh, some of my thinking about how awful philanthropy is in this country. Um, <laughs> It's good to hear, by the way, that people will still laugh at my jokes. For a while, I was worried that it was only because I was with Walter. Um, uh, uh, I, I could. Um, I actually have a lot to say about all three papers, which I very much enjoyed reading. I found them very insightful. And Dana, yours in particular, I just didn't know a lot of what you were covering. I thought you did it brilliantly. Um, I loved Andrews because he seemed to quote me more than anybody else. Okay. That was nice. Alexander, and I, did I do that? I know people do that to you, forgive me. Um, um, but I thought the most value I could add today uh, was to give you a very different narrative about what the new philanthropy in this country is all about. Uh, and I'll, so I'll talk about my own personal experience here, and I won't comment on the papers uh, ex except in passing. Um, not only yours, but the other people. Um, there is this vision that's been presented so far that you, Bill Gates sits in a Howard Hughes-like hermetically sealed bubble, and he's got these marionette strings, and he's out there you know, controlling the world. Um, I, I, I'll just tell you the alternative view, and, and maybe that view is right. I don't actually have that much to do with the Gates Foundation, have not. We, we um, co-invest in a lot of activities, but uh, we don't develop strategy together or anything like that. Um, I would go back to one of Alexander's points, which is it's actually much more fascinating to me to look at the differences among the foundations that have been talked about today than their similarities. Um, I would also point out that only one person has mentioned what I would consider one of the most important philanthropies in uh, the new philanthropy, and that's the Fisher family. Uh, I think we can, uh, we can say for sure that the Charter School Growth Fund, which was founded by Walton and Fisher, would not exist without them. It's easy to point out how KIPP would not have existed without them. Uh, it's probably not well known how important um, TFA's existence uh, is to uh, Don Fisher in particular, now, now past. Um, let me just, here's the alternative narrative. Um, John Walton and his siblings uh, in 1992 were suddenly handed one of the world's largest fortunes when Sam died, um, Mr. Sam. Um, Sam Walton was dedicated to Walmart. He did very, very little in philanthropy. Um, what he did actually turned out to be around education uh, because he saw that, as did his children, as the ladder to success in this country. Their formula was if people work hard, have strong values, and get a good education, they can have lives of opportunity, they can have lives of success. Uh, when John... Uh, first inherited the fortune and was given by his siblings like, well, you take Walmart, you take this, and John, you take the foundation, quite literally, uh, as I understand it, how it happened. John started thinking through 
well, like, what's the big problem in America that I can, uh, and that my family can invest in trying to change? Um, and you have to understand, like, I, I think there's so many misperceptions about who John Walton was. He did not grow up uh, as the son of one of the leading companies in the world. He grew up in sort of tough circumstances in Arkansas. Uh, he went to high school with people who could only be called poor. Um, he went to Vietnam with people who could only be called poor. Uh, and so he had a, um, a sensitivity, um, a passion for helping the poor. And that's why he ended up looking at K-12 education. And I have to say that part of what um, is disorienting to me today is that nobody's really talked about the problem we're trying to solve here. And the way John saw it, and the way I still see it today, and if you were alive today, I believe he'd say, we can look at the data and see that there are 16 million children that are going to lead their lives in poverty, independency, surrounded by crime, and that is criminal. And we should get up every morning. By the way, I just realized I'm beginning to sound like a shill for Howard Fuller. And um, there's a reason for that. I think Howard um, and John, and, uh, Howard had a relationship with John similar to mine in parallel, uh, where John influenced a lot of our thinking. Um, but w w when I hear some of this analysis, it seems to forget there's, and I'll show you how we can get to that number of 16 million. I can come up with another 30 million children who aren't probably getting well-educated to compete in the global economy, right? Now, there are only 75 million children in this country, and where does that leave America? So um, I, when you look at the problem and you start to say, well, what are we going to do about it? John was very clear-eyed. He said, wow, um, we have a status quo a $600 billion system when he was alive. I think it's up to $700 um, billion. You have um, what Jay called the special interest groups. Uh, let me just call out what we mean by that. Um, the trade associations, as Andrew called them. The teacher unions have an overwhelming control of K-12 education in this country, and particularly K-12 policy. Um, John realized immediately that he did not have the resources to take that on and that we needed to be um, strategic uh, in order to combat that and change things in this country. I, I say all this to help you understand, I'm going to go back to Larry's question, why do we persist when, quote, there have been mediocre results? Um, Larry, I, I can assure you that um, I could not have kept my job for 10 years. I worked for some of the most exacting people in the world if I didn't have strong results to show. The, the children who were getting educated in the schools that we helped start uh, were getting a far better education. And to the extent we spent money on research and evaluation, it was them testing that hypothesis. Is this really working? Because if it's not working, we don't want to be spending our money on it. It was a very personal thing. Um, so first of all, I'd argue we've seen a lot of gains. There's a lot more uh, high quality choices in low com income communities than there were 10 years ago when I started this work. Uh, it is still humiliating to me personally that we haven't made more progress. Um, but let's be honest about why that is. It is because of these institutions that are dedicated, and it makes sense, um, some of you know that my dad was a um, teacher union organizer, so I know that world um, a little bit, having grown up in it. Um, their, their goal is most, very natural. You know, they do not want a performance-based system, right? They don't want teacher evaluation at all, because how do you protect your members if you're going to be able to sort them by quality? Now, we can have disagreements about whether or not we should have teacher evaluation. I sense you don't think we should. Um, I no, think I, I disagree completely that oh, we good. shouldn't have teacher I wrote a whole book about it. Oh, okay. Well, I'll have to read that. I wrote it down earlier. Um, 
but, it, but if we're going to have teacher evaluation, we have to admit that it's not gonna be perfect and we're gonna to have to continuously improve it over time. That requires an honest, open debate and I, that's why I appreciated your critique of the MET study. Um, we also know they don't want school choice. I mean, how, how better to protect your customer base than to have captive customers? You can't leave. And if you live in a low-income community in many parts of this country, you still don't have choice, or as Howard and I might say, you don't have power. Um, so I see that I've run out of time. Forgive me, I didn't mean to get quite on a soapbox, but I hope I've given you a different narrative than what some of these papers uh, presented today. Thank you, Jim. All right, uh, I think we've got a lot, uh, a lot to talk about. Uh, let's go ahead and open it up. Um, questions or comments? Uh, back there. Hi, uh, Dave Price, still educational consultant who just ate lunch. Um, Jim, to you, okay, a question. If the teachers' unions and the establishment are as much a problem as you say you are, and let's accept that for a moment, was that their purpose in the very beginning, or did it somehow change? And if it did change, uh, why do you think it did? Well, let's, and let's bring this back to the philanthropy. I mean, right, we could spend weeks going back and forth on the union question in isolation, and well, I don't think any of us would emerge. Off, though, right? I did. I know, but, but I'd like to, I'd like well, to make sure we bring it back. Take your question off the table. Right? No, 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 it's fine. No, well, I just let me just, uh, let me, I'll take 10 seconds on it. Um, I didn't mean to actually say that they were a problem. I meant to say that they're doing what they're paid to do, which is to protect the status quo. But if you're in philanthropy and you want to change the status quo, it wouldn't be a very effective strategy to pour millions of dollars into the teachers' union. Leave it at that. Hi, I'm Amy Hightower, the editor of American Educator Magazine, and this has been a great conversation. Um, one thing I haven't heard a lot about, and Alexander, I think your paper gets the closest to it, is I'm curious to hear what the panelists, and you too, Rick, you brought this party together, what you all would advise um, a new philanthropist, someone who's just kind of getting into the game. Um, and I'm not talking about the top 10, even the top 20. I'm talking about somebody who, um, is a maybe a small beginning foundation? Maybe it's a, a venture capitalist who who oh wow I've got this money I want I want to do good I want to do good in education. What wh where would you suggest? What advice would you have for these people? Or would you take Dr. Cuban's uh, presumption that hey you know don't you you're not gonna you you're not gonna make that much difference? History shows. Um, this comes uh, more from my um, uh, analysis of waiting for Superman than it does uh, from the interviews that I did. Um, but one of the reasons that uh, philanthropists turned to mass media as a vehicle was realizing that uh, changing hearts and minds was as or more important than um, uh, providing a direct service or creating more uh, uh, effective teachers. Um, a new entrant in the field uh, uh, a new philanthropist might look at um, mass media. Um, there's something called the Harmony Institute, which is a foundation-funded effort to evaluate uh, mass uh, media efforts. There's also something at USC um, uh, uh, trying to measure the impact of um, these uh, documentaries or feature films that have, <clears throat> uh, or miniseries. We've seen a slew of those in recent years um, to have an impact on people's perceptions fundamental beliefs uh, about how the world should be. It's a very abstract way to go, but a very interesting way to go. Um, I don't know if you're interested in the higher ed side, but I'll give you an answer anyway. Um, uh, I would probably do what Jay suggested earlier, which is I would build new institutions um, that are built for uh, today's challenges. So I would build new institutions that are, whose goal is to actually teach students something, not just house them for four years or five years or six years or seven years, however long it takes them to finish. Um, uh, that, that's, I think that's where I would go. And, and, and to be fair, some of the philanthropies have, um, have tried to do this uh, funding, not, not necessarily f fully funding new institutions, but, but helping new ones to get off the ground. Um, I just think that's one thing. We, we don't have a charter movement in higher ed. Right, so there's no there's no sort of, sort of jurisdictional challenge, right? To use Steve Tellis and Joel Meta's point, right? There is none of that in higher ed. There's no rival set of institutions that say we do this differently. 
Um, and that's what I, one of the things I think we need. Um, I get asked this question a lot and have for the last 10 years. And I think that uh, um, my first step with almost anybody is to suggest maybe you look at higher ed um, because it's, it is difficult trying to change K-12 education. Uh, if they persist and they have asked all the questions about why, um, you know, why is it we don't have better teachers? Why is it that we have such trouble? Uh, it's, it'll usually become self-evident to them if you ask them enough why questions what the core issue is, and then I encourage them to invest there. I have to say I'm, uh, I would be, I'm, there's too much humiliation in this work to imagine that what we've done is the right thing. I think we've learned a lot in the 10 years. Uh, sometimes some of our investments have looked brilliant, other times not so much. So I'm willing to let other people try uh, very different things. I'm gonna pass on this one. <laughs> uh, Jay? So, um, first, I, I just wanna thank Jim for, for talking about John Walton because, I mean, he was a great inspiration to me I don't know if this is on um, as well. And uh, I just don't, I mean, part of why I'm concerned is I just don't think we're following the strategy that he had envisioned writ large in the reform philanthropy. Um, two thirds of the funding is not going to either uh, generating constituencies by creating choice or, or advocacy uh, for, for, for that. And so now a lot of this is um, that there are a lot of other, I mean, in the foundations I looked at, I looked at 15, um, other foundations have other strategies, and that's worth differentiating that and talking about that, as you mentioned. But I, I also just wanted to get over to, to the MET study, and Dana, thank for, thanks for, for describing this study and raising uh, concerns about it, which I, th I think are really important, but I think you missed the, the biggest concern, um, which is that the results aren't what they say they are. Um, and in particular, you repeated um, a false result uh, that's claimed, but is not actually in there. Um, uh, so one false claimed result is that uh, the student uh, surveys were strong predictors of, of, of value added. Uh, they weren't. Uh, the correlation was about 0.2. Mm -hmm. um, and 0.2 means if you square it, it right. explains about 4% of the variation. Um, the uh, teacher observations, um, there the correlation was about 0.1, uh, which means it explains about 1% of the variation, square 0.1. Um, and so together, these two other things explained about 5% of the variation. Now, I appreciate that the strongest predictor of VAM is going to be VAM. <laughs> However, if you're gonna introduce other things, you have to have some validation of those things, that they matter, that they mean anything. Um, so it has to be validated by something that right. didn't. So I, I discussed both the small effect sizes and the sec your second point at length in the paper. Um, my summary here today was to point out that you may have heard that the Gates Foundation promoted the finding that the student surveys are a strong predictor. And yep. they were one of the stronger predictors of the many different things that they looked at. I mean, there were two other false findings just to quick at them in. One is the claim that um, drilling kill was hurtful to VAM, uh, that's not true, it was positive. It was just a, a 0.18 correlation as opposed to a 0.25, right? So it's, it was slightly less positive cor uh, correlation. And the other is that the three together was the best predictor, uh, which um, was uh, trivially true. Uh, they were about the same as if you just used VAM. In other words, because the, the, the other two things, the student surveys and, and this classroom observa observations were so weak, as predictors, combining them actually didn't help. So the weird thing about MET, the really weird thing, is that the study didn't produce any of the things that are attributed to it by most people uh, or that are claimed for it. And, and the other weird thing with, that connects to earlier conversation is a lot of really high quality people were associated with that study not all of them repeated these false things, but they didn't contradict it either. When Vicki Phillips gets quoted in the New York Times and the LA Times saying things that are wrong, factually wrong, they didn't say, you know, she's wrong. They let her say it. And that's weird. I mean, if you're a tenured professor at Harvard, why do you let your work get misquoted in the paper and not correct it? That's, that's the, 
so the, the weird thing about founda what foundations do is they don't get people to say things that they don't believe, but they can get people to be quiet when they ought to speak. Dana? Um, a lot of the critiques you make are ones I discuss at length in the paper, so I'd urge you and everyone else to check it out. It's much longer than my short summary here. And the small effect sizes were a very real problem, and, and they were not discussed either in the media coverage or in the sort of shorter kind of four-page documents that the foundation put out, highlighting which reporters on deadline, that's what they look at. I actually read or skimmed all of the 1,000 pages that the foundation Anna, did put out, yes. And what, do, what do you make? Um, so, right, so, so Jay just, curious how you respond to kind of Jay's uh, interpretation. So it was not discussed much in the media, the mm -hmm. small effect sizes. Um, was not in the four-page synopsis. As you talk to those folks, as you, you know, try to make sense of all this, why do you think that was? Do you have an interpretation? The point of the project was to validate value-added measurement. So any finding that seemed to be more skeptical or pointed toward useful but maybe limited usefulness was not highlighted. I mean, just to jump in, the, the Rick and Jeff did a book on this, right? Re when research matters. I mean, this is not this is not a new phenomenon, right? That right. that that findings that run counter to somebody, whether it's a, a university academic or, right? I mean, right? right? We 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 bear, people bury non significant findings and don't publish them all the time, right, Jay? I mean, like, there's there's a sen there's there's censoring on non significant findings. In all of social science, I don't, I'm not defending. I, I think your point about okay. Why is it different? I don't want to take up something. Okay, uh, Jeff. Um, so I, w I want to follow on the Met, but use it for a bigger question. I think so. Uh, you know, a lot of the criticism today has been about foundations as being closed and not building broader uh, uh, constituencies and, um, and rushing too much to judgment and conclusion. And there's one thing that I find interesting about the Met study that's different, I think it's in the paper but not drawn out here, which is this is a database at, uh, uh, that Gates has made more openly yes. available. So the, the payoff and the interpretation of what we should be learning from this hasn't been controlled, or at least potentially hasn't been controlled in the way is often the case. And we may be learning more and different things over time. And I wonder whether that's an example of something that maybe uh, generally some folks on, on, the, on the panel might think would be a model for foundations to be thinking more about. This is a really important point, and the foundation does deserve credit for opening up these materials and the data set to scholars. One of the interesting things I found, which I discuss a little bit in the paper, is that if you look at the different public documents that the Gates Foundation put online about MET in the subsequent years, multiple years of the study, 2012 release, 2011 release, 2013 release, and then the book, that was published earlier this year, you get more and more interesting stuff with more nuance and complexity with each subsequent uh, release of documents, such that the book, which came out earlier this year, contains many um, critiques and many sort of head-scratching curiosities of the type that I listed in my presentation that were not apparent. Um, with the earlier documents. And the book was also funded by the foundation, published by the foundation. So um, that is something that I, that I found encouraging. I think what is less encouraging is that the consensus about what MET was seems to have been baked at an earlier stage. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack, can I just jump in real, yeah. sorry, real fast? Just on this. So I'm trying to get to one of my slides because that I didn't discuss very actively. But um, so if you, I'll just, give you the punchline, higher ed has been awful at studying itself, right? The foundations that give money to universities to do research, they don't give them money to study how they teach or how much students learn, right? So I think that, I mean, to your point, I think that's one thing that's very different about, about uh, the, 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 those two foundations. It cuts both ways, though. I mean, I think 
um, there's been, uh, they've really pushed performance-based funding in the states. Um, the, the, some of the better studies of whether performance-based funding impacts colleges' productivity at all have found n null results. It's unclear whether they're whether the two of them whether both foundations are going to retreat from that at all in light of that. So I, th I mean I think, right, in my area anyway, they've shined a much brighter light on these topics, but it's not always clear that it is going to change the behavior. So. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to return to this question of what a new foundation with modest resources might do, um, wanting to improve K through twelve and education for low-income and minority children. And I would say um, they should begin to work with groups of teachers, that that's the starting place. And I don't think it matters whether they're unionized teachers or not unionized or, or ununionized. The point is to work closely first before anything else. Uh, with groups of teachers. And um, let me refer back to Larry Cuban's paper. He has a whole list of the kinds of questions that teachers ask, which are completely different from the kinds of questions that foundations ask. But the questions that the teachers are asking are exactly, I think, where the foundations should begin. Okay. Sort of twofold. Um, why, uh, Jim? You you were very close with John. You knew you were helped develop the vision. You were part of it. You were close to the passion that the found the Walton Foundation um, had about these issues. So why isn't it okay that they they earn the money? Why can't they spend it and give freely to what they feel passionate about? And then two. Alexander. And when you say they can't, you mean in terms of? Well, they're, they're criticized for, okay. for so trying to. it's not prohibited, to, but right. you mean why, why, why are they right. criticized? For and then feel that they have to, you know, backtrack and, and, you know, CYA through the whole process. But, you know, I, I just don't understand why these philanthropists aren't allowed to just give the way they want. And then also, Alexander, to your eight, or your, your, your last slide, which was saying what's next. So, Jim, too, the further you get away from those people who actually earn the income or made or, or sort of built the foundation of their foundations, um, are we starting to see ourselves trying to, you know, compartmentalize how they give or how foundations work? So first of all, I, I do want to say that the Walton family at least does not look at it that way. Um, they see their foundation, which is, you know, a tax incentive trust, um, as something that they're trying to do good with for the public. And so they welcome public input, uh, and they, um, unlike uh, apparently other foundations, part of my job was to be very accessible to people, uh, to be getting input, uh, to be answering questions, uh, because that's how you learn. And that's their attitude about it, and I think it's actually a good one. Um, uh, that said, when they don't retreat from what they're doing under criticism, um, I think their perspective on that is a lot of the criticism are coming from people that are part of the problem. And um, they should be allowed to make that decision, right? That if we're really going to try and change public education so that low-income children in this country can get an education, then I think you have to be careful about um, just responding to the criticism like, oh, well, then I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, you should also... Uh, take note of how many people have been uh, frightened away from K-12 education um, because of the pressure and because of the criticism, which is coming from the status quo. Uh, and I, you know, to be more pointed about it, I think it's fascinating how the Gates Foundation's investment in K-12 has become a smaller and smaller portion of their work. Uh, that partly, I think, is due to criticism. I think it's also partly due to how hard it is to impact the sector. I heard Bill one time, Bill Gates say at one point, you know, everything I got done in one year was washed away the next year by the local school boards, right? So there, you need a level of persistence and long-term vision in order to stay in this work. So. Mark? I wanted to uh, go back, Alexander, to your six. Oh. Uh, Mark Porter McGee with 50 Can. I want to go back to your six summaries. Uh, and my sense is so this came out of interviewing grantees and foundations. Were there things other than those six predictors that you thought should be on people's minds that aren't? 
So maybe a chance for you to get on your soapbox a little bit and tell us what are the things you see that maybe we have blind spots about. Um, uh, uh, all sorts of things came up in the interviews. Uh, again, I was talking to people who'd been involved in grant making for a long time, and, and uh, uh, all sorts of things ca uh, came up. Um, some of the things that, uh, that I thought might come up that didn't come up in these sort of open-ended questions, um, um, uh, one was the issue of, um, uh, this issue of uh, funding of mass media uh, didn't come up. I've been uh, fascinated by it because I'm part of it. Uh, didn't come up very often either as a great best thing that ever happened or the worst waste of uh, funding. Um, the uh, uh, support for nonprofit or the support for the, the creation of nonprofits, uh, um, uh, news gathering and reporting, um, the issue of sort of uh, the journalistic side um, of things, uh, which is a big, relatively new part of um, uh, grant making doesn't come up, <clears throat> didn't come up. And by the way, um, uh, for all of you, or for any of you who may think that um, it's uh, only the new uh, philanthropists who are giving to, uh, to journalism, um, it's not the case at all. Um, uh, Ford is, uh, as a, just as an example, Ford is very much involved in funding uh, education, uh, news, and reporting. That's the, the most obvious thing um, that, that uh, didn't come up. Um, I didn't hear a lot, uh, 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 apropos of this panel in particular, I also didn't hear a lot um, about um, whether um, uh, the focus should return to research, um, uh, whether, whether the research uh, allocation um, needed to uh, go up or not. I heard from a couple of uh, uh, grantees that um, they wish that there was more money out there for independent research, Alexander, but I didn't hear a lot about that from the grant makers. Alexander, let me, uh, the, 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 this whole question of, of philanthropic support for reporting, for media, kind of the ProPublica model, mm -hmm. kind of curious, especially in light of, uh, you know, Dana and Jay's exchange a moment ago, that we are, right, that a lot of this reporting might not be, it might not exist today, the chalkboards, uh, the chalk beats, the rest, if it weren't for foundation support. But it does seem that if your coverage is being underwritten by Foundation X or Y, and they're passionate about these new leadership training programs, or they're passionate about this, it does seem like it perhaps puts some of these folks in the same kind of bind that Jay was alluding to, as far as how dig deep are you going to dig, how much attention are you mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious. Dana, Dana, you too. Yeah, I would love to respond to this because in my looking at the MET project and the complexity of reporting on it, I thought Education Week did the best job. I mean, it's not surprising. It's their full-time job to cover education. But Stephen Sawchuk's coverage in particular of MET, he really did tease out to the extent possible with his word limit some of the, the methodological complexities. And Ed Week does receive... Uh, Gates Foundation funding, and I think that in general they've done a good job of covering the Gates Foundation, and probably folks at the Gates Foundation haven't always been thrilled, and yet Edweek is a grantee. So I don't think it's um, a given that if you accept foundation money that you're intellectually compromised. Are there tensions here, or is it not something that we need to kind of worry about? Go ahead. No. I was just going to say that I, I, one thing that occurred to me and when I was doing our study, Gates and Lumina do give money to media organizations. Um, uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, on the one hand, got grants from Gates uh, in particular, and I think Lumina as well, I can't recall. Um, but they, they did this big uh, story about the Gates effect, right, and how Gates had its tentacles sort of everywhere. So it was sort of this interesting, you know, they got a lot of heat for that because they said, well, you guys are, now you're, now you're criticizing them after you got all this money. Um, but I would just say one thing quickly. I do think that there's a distinction that I would just throw on the table, and and my slide about amplifying voices versus, um, you know, purchasing them or something. The some people are supposed to be objective, and some people aren't, right? Um, and so, and and there are think tanks and advocacy organizations in D.C. that that make no claim to object objectivity, right? Um, but there, but but I think I do think media and journalism, I'd like to think anyway, uh, is different. Um, I. Uh uh, on the issue of, on the journalistic side, um, uh, anyone who takes money from anyone has to uh, deal with these issues of uh, autonomy and independence, whether you're a research organization, a nonprofit, a think tank, or a media outlet. Um, the media outlets have long had to deal with um, the issue of outside influence. It just used to be advertisers, 
Um, uh, uh, but commercial media had to deal with Campbell's Soup not liking uh, coverage of the recall on chicken noodle soup. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this issue of uh, the 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 this issue of how you respond to who's paying the bills has has always has always been there to some extent. Um, it's a little uh, closer now because it's Ed funders and Ed uh, journalism. Um, but um, I think the, the concept is out there, and at a certain point, the readers have to um, uh, use their own minds. This is a really important point, because in the same way that the MET project represented a major investment by the Gates Foundation in high-quality research directed toward a specific question, this question of student achievement, measurable student achievement, and teacher practices, and the link between them, foundations direct media giving sometimes toward coverage of specific areas. So for example, a news organization will receive a grant to cover pre-K. And one single reporter is assigned to cover pre-K full time because her entire salary could be paid by a foundation. So again, the terms of the conversation are, are very highly influenced by the foundation. It doesn't mean that the resulting coverage is low quality or compromised. So just a hodgepodge of things. First, I didn't mean to suggest earlier that that the the foundations are buying um, communication, you know, silence or buying a change in opinion. Um, I think, it, it, although sometimes people censor themselves, yeah, uh, or distort themselves, mm -hmm. um, uh, but they also may have reasons for doing so. So it's I think all of you actually handled that well. That it is kind of complicated, and frankly, there is no pure world. Everyone has to get paid somehow by someone. Uh, uh, government money, you know, you have to worry about what the government thinks then, right? So it's, it's, there's no pure source of money here. Um, uh, but b back on Matt, just sorry to gnaw at this bone, um, but um, the weird, there are other weird things about it, like that the project was actually done by the foundation itself, which is not normal. Normally, money is given to another organization to do research. That was done actually by, by Gates itself. And, and so then it's a little bit strange to then sing the praises of the Gates Foundation for making the data available when that's normal. That's normal world. The rest of the world is like that, right? You fund research, and if, if I publish research, then the data become publicly, I mean, usually journals require that you make your, your data available, and you know, I don't know, my, Charlotte voucher study, uh, you know, the data were publicly available and they've been replicated by others because they're available. That's, that's normal. We don't, so it's strange to me that we have to say how awesome they are for doing the weird thing of conducting the work themselves, but then they made it available to others. Um, uh, the weird part was doing it themselves, not, not the, the, the positive thing of making it available to others. So, you know, one of the things that I think Jeff and I were interested in and as we commissioned these papers was trying to make sense of how much is different today than it was a decade ago. A decade ago, we were in the immediate kind of shadow of No Child Left Behind. Uh, there were a third as many charter schools in the country as there are today. Uh, nobody was using value-added metrics. Um, in a few years later, in 2009, you saw coverage that school vouchers were dead right before Indiana and Louisiana did statewide voucher programs. So I'm just kind of curious, as we think about so many of these ins and outs, um, curious what lessons you guys draw from you know, reflection and from research about how things have changed and what folks might anticipate going forward. Uh, I'll perhaps unwisely um, jump in. Um, the, the, the shift, the expansion of the uh, grant making to include, um, uh, b to go beyond programs and services um, is an, uh, seems like a clear uh, uh, measurable change and uh, one that um, uh, doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. The other major shift. So beyond programs and services into? Uh, policy, advocacy, uh, media. 
Um, that's something that um, uh, uh, seems to be, um, came up consistently in my interviews and something that um, uh, uh, has been written about quite a bit. And was that a reaction to frustration or how did, how did the people you interviewed think about that shift? A lot of it had to do with the fact that, um, uh, that well, either that the um, doing the direct funding of grants and services, the scale was too big for uh, private dollars to go. Uh, you can't train, uh, a foundation no matter how large can't train directly train 3.2 million teachers. Um, so the idea was to uh, maximize or, or um, uh, accelerate the impact by addressing things at the policy level rather than uh, providing after school tutoring or a, a teacher training program. Um, that seems to be a, a big change. Um, uh, wise or unwise, I'll leave to, uh, leave to the others. The other main change that came up in my interviews, which just had to do with the mechanics or the, the strategy of giving the grants, that the way in which the, the grant proposals are, the, the way in which the grants are conceived of uh, uh, and uh, either open to competition or simply um, given out under a negotiated set of circumstances, it seems like that world is very much different. This idea of foundations with much narrower sets of priorities than they used to have, not necessarily taking the best um, idea in off the street on any topic, but taking the, the, the best idea on the topics that have been selected. And that was there seems a, to be different. And was the there a sense among the folks you interviewed that foundation direction and the green eye shade element uh, has been enormously healthy or that it's gone too far or was there a consensus? Um, uh, a little bit, the, the, the best summary I could give it is a little bit of it was a good thing, um, but that the, um, the uh, sometimes the consultants, uh, I heard a lot about um, uh, philanthropic consultants, which is a sector that's grown tremendously in recent years. Um, it didn't exist a decade ago. Uh, probably not. Um, folks have come along to help foundations figure out to, how to give their money out more strategically, that sometimes they, like anybody else, um, uh, ends up adding a lot of bells and whistles to the process. Tim? Uh, so to me, it's a, I'm sorry. It, it's a particularly poignant question for me because uh, roughly 10 years ago, John was killed in a plane crash, and I then found myself leading the foundation. Uh, so I could have a, I might write a paper from you, for you sometime about what's happened in the last 10 years. Um, so much has changed. Um, I'll, I want to talk specifically about this issue, um, but I also want to acknowledge so much has not changed. Uh, that after 10 years, you know, 10 years ago, people were saying, you know, the truth is those low-income black and brown children probably can't learn. Um, well, that has changed, right? Because of groups like KIPP and TFA and others, we've shown that low-income children can get a good education and get on a new trajectory in their lives. Um, the attitudes toward the uh, protectors of the status quo have changed markedly over the last 10 years. Um, and look, 10 years ago, they were telling us, oh, you'll never scale charter schools. That's just impossible. Uh, anybody who knows anything about scaling knows uh, you can scale anything, right? And so then, but it took New Orleans to change people's point of view about that. Um, can I talk about metrics for a second? Because I want, uh, I would really like if, if any people in the philanthropy world are listening to this, I would hope uh, that they can take some cautionary lessons from the work. Um, I, I know for a fact that when people make this criticism, they are talking about the Walton Family Foundation. Uh, and the reason they're, they're doing that is because there was a stark change. I think Gates probably always had very clear metrics that they were accused of micromanaging around. Um, and it used to be when it was, you know, me and two other program officers, um, we did not create metrics. We said, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> um, and, and look, I long for them myself. What happened um, was, I think, a healthy thing, and, uh, and it's a pendulum swing. So let me explain. We were having a lot of grantees um, say, well, I'll take your money, but, you know, and then they just keep doing whatever they were doing. And they came back to us and said, help us think about the best way to use your resources. And we'd say, well, let's talk about a theory of change. Well, you know, you, you want this outcome. What outputs are you looking for? What inputs do you need? 
And that's where our metrics process came from, where we were helping people think through, well, if you're gonna get to there, what do you need to do in order to get there? And we'll, uh, and some people say we should be developing these collaboratively. Uh, the truth is, these are things the grantees should present to the, to the donors to say, this is what I'll say I'll do. Uh, is that good enough to get your money? And usually the answer should be yes. Uh, if it is just lazy or if the program officer does not believe that it will lead to those outcomes, then you have a more collaborative discussion. Um, what I hope we can get back to is that, that essence where people say, let me be very clear about how I'll use this money, what kind of outcomes I'm expecting to have, and then I'll happily be measured at the end of the grant based on that. So. That's great. Andrew Dana, final thoughts? Um, sure, I would just say uh, what's changed from 10 years ago, I think the public perception of higher ed is very different now than it was. Um, Time Magazine asked people, uh, is higher education in crisis? And in 2012, 89% of people said yes. 50% said it was on the wrong track. Um, that's very different, I think, from where we've been. Um, one question I do have going forward is, um, for the foundations in particular, is that have the stars been aligned for the last six years in that you had a recession that created a lot of room to push for productivity and new ways of delivering education. That's now uh, slowly recovering. State budgets are recovering, particularly in higher ed. Um, and, and then you had a president who was very bullish on the human capital agenda um, and, set, and set an attainment goal, as Lumen and Gates both did as well. So once those things change, I wonder, um, you know, will the, will the sort of sledding um, be as easy for them as it has been? Dana, last word. Um, I think Andrew's point, his last point there is really important about the perfect storm of the past six years. To me, um, as someone who's written and thought a lot about teaching, one of the major things that have changed over the past decade is the, lo is the view of the individual teacher in the individual classroom as the locus of change in this system. In addition to the other things that we care about and have talked about today, like charter schools, I really think, and I think we all know, that teacher quality has been the focus of education reform since President Obama came into office in particular. So that is a huge shift. I mean, when you think about No Child Left Behind, it was not very much about one individual teacher. It was about the school as the organizing principle. Now we talk about the classroom. So that is a huge, incredible change. Um, with my view of 200 years of history coming off my book project, I feel a little bit cynical and probably agree with Larry that 10 years from now, we probably won't still be talking quite as much about teacher quality. I, I would find that unlikely, um, in part because of the pendulum swing that you just described in terms of how you use metrics or think about metrics. I mean, that can define so much of education reform. And now that we have gone very deep on teacher quality, teacher evaluation, metrics for teachers, I, th I, I know that we are now swinging in, a, in another direction. Um, and we'll see, we'll see where we land. But I'd be very surprised in 10 years if we had another conference on pathbreaking philanthropy, if teacher quality would be as big of a focus. All right, well, we, we can actually put uh, five bucks in the kitty, That's where we are. <laughs> um, hey, I just want to uh, thank all of you. I want to thank the authors on the day for a terrific set of papers. I want to thank the discussants. Uh, delighted all of you could join us. Um, quick word on that. Uh, the papers are available um, out in the foyer. They will also be available uh, for the next few months online. Uh, the video of today's conference, if I don't know whether or not they were figured out the live stream issue. If not, either way, it will be available uh, online tomorrow uh, if uh, folks want to watch or point others to it. Uh, the book uh, out of this will be available from Harvard Ed Press sometime uh, later this year or what have you. Uh, I'll let those guys worry about things like publication schedules, uh, but you will be able to get all of this in that format. And I finally, I want to say a word of thanks to Jen Hatfield uh, for doing a terrific job pulling this together. Uh, guys, thank you for a terrific final panel, and we'll look forward to seeing you all soon.